essentially you have four cranial nerves at each segment of the brain stem and uh, there's an asterisk here so i'll talk about what that means in a second so you know when you're talking about your brain stem that's this structure here so you have your medulla you have your pons and you have your midbrain and so that's going from inferior superiorly so there's three segments in the midbrain and then when we talk about lesions in the midbrain we're talking about is the lesion going to be a midline or is it going to be a lateral or a side lesion and that's pretty much it if you know the segment and you know if it's midline or lateral you just have to know which artery is associated with that really quickly let's go through the arteries in the medulla so in the midline medulla is mostly going to be the anterior spinal artery in the lateral medulla it's going to be your posterior inferior cerebellar artery when you go up to the pons you have your basilar artery which is going to be the midline and now it's going to be your anterior inferior cerebellar artery when you go up to the midbrain it's going to be your basilar artery again in the middle your superior cerebellar artery the one thing i want to say too about the blood supply here is there's a lot of different arteries that actually supply the different regions of the brainstem you know in the in the midbrain there's actually components from the posterior cerebral artery as well and some other things so you know this is not a hard and fast rule this is just the arteries that they usually ask about because th this is such a complex region in the body that you can make an entire exam on just this region so but these are the big things to remember okay all right so let's look at the four rules here so so there's so there's four rules like we said rule of fours there's four rules rule one there's four cranial nerves for each segment of the brainstem the exception is the midbrain only has two so the midbrain does not have cranial nerves one and two so if you just go and take one and two out you can say okay three four is in the midbrain five six seven eight is in the pons nine ten eleven twelve in the medulla and then we have one more asterisk one more kind of exception is that the vestibular nucleus or portions of it is in the medulla okay so that's cranial nerve eight so you can see cranial nerve eight is kind of at that transition where you go from the pons to the medulla and it has multiple nuclei right it doesn't just have one and so the vestibular portion the vestibular nucleus is in the medulla and we'll talk about why that's significant in a little bit but in reality it doesn't change much in terms of what you look at to figure out which stroke pattern is they're asking about okay so it, it's not as big of a deal as it looks right here but you still want to remember it's an exception rule two is really important rule two says if you take the number 12 and you divide it by the cranial nerve you're talking about if it's evenly divisible the nucleus is midline if it's not evenly divisible it's going to be a lateral or side nucleus so for example let's take cranial nerve three if you took 12 divided by three you get four so it's an evenly divisible number it's in the midline right same thing if you took let's say you took six right the abducens nucleus 12 divided by six would be two so it's an evenly divisible number it's in the midline let's say you take cranial nerve seven the facial nucleus 12 divided by seven not evenly divisible so it's a lateral structure so if you just know rule one and two you can pretty much figure out almost all the questions if not all of them they would ask about the location of stroke in a brainstem lesion and i'll show you why in a little bit i have a whole slide just on the brainstem strokes and stuff so rule three there's the four midline structures begin with m really the big one you want to remember is the motor pathways to your cortical spinal tract so if it's a midline lesion you're going to have for motor neuron science for the cortical spinal tract medial meniscus is another big one it's going to be your dcml pathway your dorsal column so your vibration proprioception um, the medial longitudinal fasciculus is going to involve internuclear opth uh, ophthalmoplegia we'll talk about that as well and then your uh, motor nuclei so remember that cranial nerve 3 4 6 and 12 all have motor components to their cranial nerve nuclei rule 4 is going to be the lateral structures or the side structures so the structures that begin with s essentially so your spinal cerebellar tract going to the cerebellum spinothalamic which is going to be your pain temperature crude touch the sensory nucleus of five and you know I think this is just filled in here to keep the rule of fours going because you already know if you do, if you know rule one and two you know five is going to be a lateral structure right it's not evenly to, uh, 12 doesn't uh, divide evenly into five this is kind of a redundant one and then sympathetics you know your horner syndrome that kind of thing all that's going to be lateral okay so now let's talk a little bit about ischemia and strokes and so the um, epidemiology so there's a lot of things that can cause it you can read through this you can memorize these but hypertension diabetes smoking hypertension is probably the major risk factor but when we talk about chronic hypertension if they go out of their way to talk about chronic hypertension a lot of times they're going to be talking about lacunar infarcts which i'll talk about in a little bit afib mechanical valves pfo so eight so these three are, re are referring more of to the embolic like strokes and so afib right 
atria is not the left atrium is not contracting the way it should we get stasis of blood when we get stasis of blood we form a clot that clot can go from the left atrium into the left ventricle get kicked up to the brain and you have an embolic stroke now typically since we're on the topic of embolic strokes when you have an embolic stroke typically those infarctions are large vessel infarctions in other words one of your major vessels like your middle cerebral artery you know if you have an embolism that goes into the middle cerebral artery and blocks it proximally you can just shut off the whole region that gets blood supply from the middle cerebral artery so typically larger strokes that happen acutely are going to be more of the embolic phenomenon whereas the thrombotic strokes are going to be more of a kind of stuttering neurologic deficit that gets worse maybe gets a little bit better then gets a lot worse and doesn't happen as acutely as the embolic okay and that's not a hard and fast rule but in general that's kind of how they want you to think about it now the other thing i want to say is pfos are going to be associated with your cryptogenic kind of strokes which means a cryptogenic stroke is like one that you haven't identified a source for this might be a person that doesn't have a lot of risk factors maybe they don't have hypertension diabetes or smoking you know maybe it may be a young female who uses uh, ocps for example and maybe she smokes a little bit and you know she ends up having a stroke and you're like well i can't figure out why things you want to consider for pfo is like if somebody has a dvt normally we're worried about dvts because they can fall they can form pulmonary emboli how does that work well if you have a proximal venous clot it goes up to the inferior vena cava goes into the right atrium goes into the right ventricle goes into the pulmonary artery blocks the pulmonary artery you get a pulmonary embolus right that's just the general concept but let's say that you have a pfo if you have a pfo or a patent foramen ovale you have complete blood flow between the right and left atrium right so you can have blood in the right atrium go to the left now if you have a patient that has that and they have a dvt that clot comes up to the right atrium goes into the left atrium goes into the left ventricle gets kicked out now you get a stroke and you can't figure out where this stroke came from maybe this person doesn't have afib they don't have a mechanical valve but when you do an echo you see that they have a pfo and you're like oh okay now i get it that it could have come from a dvt for example so those are those are trickier questions pretty rare in real life but stuff that they like to ask about because it tests your knowledge of the anatomy a little bit okay so we said thrombotic strokes are due to clot obstruction you get an atherosclerotic plaque that can occlude a vessel just enough to cause ischemia and then embolism um, large emboli can clo uh, can close off large vessels right afib is classic for that it's a classic risk factor anybody that has a stroke is going to be put on telemetry because you want to monitor their heart to see if they go into afib that's a huge risk factor um, a lot of times patients if you can't really identify a source you'll send them home on a holter monitor just so you can continue to monitor the heart to make sure that they don't have afib because you don't want this happening again if it was afib so hyperperfusion this is just you know if you have hypovolemia for example or you're in shock first areas that are going to be affected are going to be the watershed areas now remember also your mean arterial pressure subtracted from your icp right is going to give you cerebral perfusion pressure in other words the amount of pressure coming in from the heart minus the pressure in the brain is going to give you the pressure left over that can go and supply these territories that being the cerebral perfusion pressure if you have really high icp it's going to prevent perfusion to a lot of these regions okay so keep that in mind and so that can also cause you know watershed areas to be infarcted so what are watershed areas let me go back so you have your anterior cerebral artery here okay which is this middle territory then you have your middle cerebral artery which is this huge territory here and your pca which is more like occipital lobe region if there was hyperperfusion the first areas affected would be these purple areas and that's because they have the porous perfusion of the region okay so it's kind of like these corners that uh, you see here in purple and those areas would be first affected by hypoperfusion and then there's a cerebral venous thrombosis which i actually was going to talk about in this video but this video got incredibly long i can't even imagine how long it's going to be when i'm done talking you guys obviously know but so i didn't include it here but i will definitely have a video on this at some point probably in the 200 highest steel playlist it just didn't make this one middle cerebral artery anterior cerebral artery posterior cerebral artery right those are the three big vessels we just talked about now there's also small vessels like we said from chronic hypertension you can get lacunar infarcts we're going to talk about this in great detail but uh, most common area affected for this is going to be the basal ganglia but you can affect the thalamus and internal capsule as well and like i said we'll talk about this in a minute i kind of skipped over the pathogenesis so let's talk about that this is the stuff that you know step one really loves to talk about so basically let's say that you have decreased perfusion to a region of the brain that's going to cause you to go through anaerobic metabolism and just a quick recap this with biochem right oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor of the electron transport chain 
you don't have oxygen around, you're not going to be going through TCA cycle and electron transport chain. Your pyruvate instead is going to be getting converted to lactate because you have an excess NADH that you need to burn off, basically. You can't just be sitting on all this NADH. So your pyruvate gets converted to lactate and you end up with a lactic acidosis, right? That's anaerobic metabolism. Now, in the setting of the brain, you're going to have low ATP because you're not going through electron transport chain. And so the low ATP is going to make the environment it's going to change the ion gradients because ATP is responsible for managing a lot of the pumps that can pump ions you know, against their gradient. And when you don't have ATP, you can't really do that. So normally, outside of the cell, glutamate is in low concentrations. But when these pumps aren't working, glutamate is going to reestablish concentrations to balance the ion gradient. Now, the thing that you really want to remember that's particularly high yield is that glutamate is involved. If you know that, you're pretty much good. Now, glutamate binds to NMDA receptors. So when glutamate gets in high concentrations outside the cell because the pumps aren't working, glutamate is going to bind to these NMDA receptors, which set off a cascade and cause calcium influx. Here's another thing you want to remember from, you know, pathology, right? If you have calcium influx, it's going to activate the mitochondria and eventually lead to apoptosis, and that's going to eventually lead to infarction. And that's primarily because neurons, they don't regenerate. Well, you infarct them, they're not going to come back. It's going to be irreversible damage. Now, we'll talk about in a minute there's reactive gliosis by uh, astrocytes and that kind of thing, but in general, um, you're going to have uh, some irreversible nerve damage after an infarction. Process that occurs when you start infarct infarcting tissue is a liquefactive necrosis. You're gonna have some fats and lipids in there and that's gonna cause the macrophages to come in and gobble up those lipids before you're able to form a glial scar. So just remember liquefactive necrosis and then the hippocampus is an important region to remember uh, when you're talking about ischemia and Alzheimer's disease. Those are two times you wanna really remember your hippocampus. So the hippocampus is very sensitive to ischemia. Finally, let's talk about the histology here. So the histology, it's important to remember the timeline and then like one or two big things about what happens. So in the first 12 to 24 hours, we have uh, red neurons forming. Okay, so that's these guys here. So these red neurons are these cells that are dying. So you can see it's bright red, bright red. The big thing to know here is, you know, why are they turning red? So remember, in some video a very long time ago, I talked about nissel bodies. And nissel bodies are basically the rough endoplasmic reticulum of neurons. Nissel bodies stain blue, or they're basophilic. You lose the nissel bodies as you have this calcium influx that's set off from the glutamate cascade. And um, remember, the calcium influx is activating the mitochondria to basically undergo apoptosis. And so you have a uh, loss of your initial bodies. So you lose the blue color and it turns red. So that's why they're called red neurons. In days one through three, it's important to remember that neutrophils arrive first. They're like the first responders. And then you have the macrophages. And you can see here, here's some neural tissue. But then here, there's all this wide open space on this side. And that's all lipids. It's all fat. And these macrophages, this guy here and this here, these macrophages are gobbling up. They're eating up all of the uh, lipids. Doing this to clear this space out so that they can, you can have a reactive gliosis and eventually a glial scar and new blood vessels form. And so that's what the macrophages are doing here. So days one through three are neutrophils, and then typically three and five will be your macrophages that come in to kind of finish cleaning things up. And remember, your macrophages and the CNS are going to be your microglia. Okay, and then weeks one through two, you have these blood vessels, right? Vascular proliferation. These are actually little red blood cells that are sitting in these vessels, okay? So this is vascular formation occurring, and so that's gonna happen in weeks one to two, vascular proliferation, and then you have your reactive gliosis from astrocytes. When you look at a contrast enhancement of somebody's brain, after a week, right, or two weeks, you can see areas light up, and that's because of the vascular prol proliferation. That's responsible for the contrast enhancement for, you know, for whatever region was infarcted. And finally here you can see these astrocytes and you can see all of this kind of reticular mesh-like network and this is part of the reactive gliosis that will eventually form a glial scar and that mesh will actually kind of help reform the blood-brain barrier. But like we said, the, a lot of the nerve tissue that was destroyed, it won't regenerate, okay, because nerve neurons don't regenerate. If you have an infarction at the middle cerebral artery, you want to remember the effects are going to be at the contralateral face and upper limb. So if it's a left-sided... Uh, middle cerebral artery stroke for whatever reason right maybe it's embolic maybe it's ischemic person will have right-sided arm weakness sensory loss right-sided you know facial weakness sensory loss okay so that's kind of the general way to think about it for the middle cerebral artery that's particularly high yield to know everybody should know that and then you should know if we're talking about the lower extremities we're talking about the anterior cerebral artery posterior cerebral artery is mostly going to be your occipital lobe so you're thinking more not so much of a particular region in the body being weak, but you're thinking more about vision deficits. And I'll talk about the specific vision deficits in, in great detail in a few slides. Now, middle cerebral artery can also have some um, 
cortical signs. Okay, what are cortical signs? It's hemineglect, Broca's aphasia, all of these other things, not your uh, cut and dry weakness and sensory loss. So first off, let's talk about what, what is the dominant hemisphere? Right-handed people generally almost always have a left dominant brain. And most people are right-handed. So you want to play odds, right? Like if you go to Vegas, you want to play odds, you're going to say, I'm going to say that in this question, this person is a left dominant brain. If they don't tell you what hand they use to write, they're left dominant until proven otherwise. Okay, that's how you approach questions. Now, if they tell you that they're left-handed, it gets tricky, okay? And they're usually not gonna do this because it's not fair. Believe it or not, most left-handed people are actually left-sided dominant, but there are a significant proportion that are right-sided dominant. So, not a fair question. So in general, you can almost always assume it's gonna be left dominant brain unless they explicitly tell you this person is right dominant. Now, Broca's aphasia is due to an infarction at the superior division of the MCA, but not to get confused with its location, which is in uh, the Broca's area, which is in the inferior frontal lobe. Remember, the MCA is cr covering a lot of territory in the brain, and so it's going to cover the inferior temporal lobe as well as the superior temporal lobe. The inferior temporal lobe is going to be the superior division of the MCA, and that's Broca's area. The superior temporal lobe is going to be from the inferior division of the MCA, and that's Wernicke's area. They're usually not going to ask you about the division of the MCA, but just in case, you know, keep that in mind. But in general, you definitely want to know where Broca's and Wernicke's area is. That's particularly high yield. Now, with Broca's area, you have your broken speech, okay? So, in other words, the person really can't talk. I mean, that's not completely true, right? Sometimes they can talk, but, but for the purposes of examination, right, keep things simple. Broca's area, broken speech. They have difficulty talking, okay, loss of fluency. Wernicke's, Wernicke's area is going to be loss of comprehension. So word salad is the way that they describe that. You're just talking constantly and it has no meaning. If you watch a YouTube video on this, usually you can't forget it. Loss of fluency with Broca's, loss of comprehension, but repetition is intact with both of these. And Broca's is like the expressive aphasia because you can't express what you want to say. And Wernicke's aphasia is the receptive because even though you can talk, you can't receive information very well. And so that's why it's a receptive aphasia. Now, so here's Broca's area, inferior frontal lobe, lesion, expressive aphasia, inferior division of MCA. And then you can see uh, Wernicke's area here, superior temporal lobe. We talked about this. And now there's this region of nerve fibers that connects the two known as the arcuate fasciculus. If you have a lesion there, you actually lose your repetition. But you, if it's just in the arcuate fasciculus, it doesn't affect these other areas, then everything else is going to be intact and just lose repetition. If you have a global aphasia, if you have a proximal MCA stroke, right, let's say you have AFib, you have a, an emboli that occludes this large vessel, like we talked about, you can have a global aphasia. You can knock out all of these areas. You can lose repetition, fluency, and comprehension. There's also transcortical aphasias. I'm not gonna talk about all that. There's just uh, not enough time to go through all that. So, all right, so remember though, this has to be in the dominant hemisphere. So most people, this has to happen on the left side of the brain. If you have a lesion on the right side of the brain in most people, and it's in the inferior frontal lobe, right inferior frontal lobe, it's not gonna give you a Broca's aphasia. So remember that. Okay, now the other thing is uh, Wernicke's can cause a, a right superior quadrantopsia. We're going to talk about that, I promise. It has to do with these pathways, Myers loop, which runs through the temporal lobe, which is also where Wernicke's area is. Uh, we're not going to talk about that just yet, but for now, just kind of, you can memorize that, and then I'll talk about why that is in a little bit. Articulostriate arteries. So these are those little arteries that go to like the thalamus, basal ganglia, internal capsule. And because those fibers from, like for example, for motor coming down from the internal capsule, they actually are going to carry fibers for the face, the upper limb, and the lower limb. So all of these, you can get a, a really mixed picture here. You can have some of these deficits kind of everywhere, but they lack cortical signs. In other words, you're not going to get hemineglect. You're not going to get a Broca's aphasia. You're not knocking out huge territories, but you're affecting a particular region region where a lot of the motor or sensory fibers could be. And these are your lacunar infarcts classically, classically associated with chronic hypertension. That's a very high yield to remember. And so you get this lipohyalinosis where you get like lipid deposition in these really small vessels, leads to a fibrinoid degeneration, and you have these very small microatheromas that can cause ischemia here. All of this is happening because of the very high pressures and aging also, with the very high pressures is really the catalyst for lacunar infarcts. Okay, so now that we've we've come full circle, and so we're gonna kind of test what we talked about earlier. The biggest of these strokes that I would probably want you to remember, and I've also seen this a few times in real life, is the uh, posterior inferior cerebellar artery strokes, which is the lateral medullary syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome. Okay, so you wanna remember Wallenberg. Sometimes they use that name to describe the syndrome. 
Now, we're talking about the lateral medulla, right? Which is going to be, like we said, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. There's a lot of things that can be going on in this patient. But if the patient has a dysphagia, hoarseness, and an impaired gag reflex, or any of those, and they're asking, where is the lesion? Okay, it's game over. You don't need all this other information, right? You don't need Horner syndrome. You can get Horner syndrome in a few different strokes, right? It's not specific. You know, your spinal thalamic tract sympathetics, that will help tell you if there's loss of pain and temperature, and uh, that's going to tell you that it's probably a lateral lesion. But the thing that you really want to know is their dysphagia, hoarseness, or an impaired gag reflex, because then you're going to think automatically just from that, it's probably going to be a lateral medullary problem or posterior inferior cerebellar. Why? Because this is cranial nerves 9 and 10. 9 and 10 are in the medulla, right? They're, the, they're in the bottom four cranial nerves, and they're not, 12, 12 doesn't evenly divide into these numbers, so they're lateral. So if you have these three facts, it's pretty much game over when you're localizing the lesion. For basilar artery, the locked-in syndrome, this, this one's not so much about localizing the lesion a lot of the times, it's just about recognizing the disease process. And so these are uh, patients that have quadriplegia, right, can't move their limbs. Um, sometimes they'll have impairment of the horizontal eye movements, but their vertical eye movements are intact. And they also have preserved consciousness, so they communicate through the vertical eye movement. So it's a terrifying disease uh, process, and it's called locked-in syndrome, and that typically happens through infarctions of the basilar artery. Okay, so for the lateral pontine syndrome, so right, so now we're, we're talking about the pons again, facial paralysis, loss of anterior sensation of the two-thirds of the tongue, Horner syndrome, vertigo, you can also have ataxia, right, uh, because the spinal cerebellar tracts are running on the lateral side, you can also have loss of uh, temperature and pain, because the spinal thalamic tracts are lateral, but again, the big thing here is if you know that you, they have facial paralysis or they have loss of taste in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, if they go out of the way to tell you that, it's pretty much game over, right? They gave you the answer because cranial nerve 7 is going to be going to be lateral. It's not 12 doesn't divide evenly into it, and it's in the pons. So if there's problems with this or they have hyperacusis or something that's talking about cranial nerve 7 specifically, you have your answer, okay? So that's kind of the way to think about it. You, there's certain nuclei you want to look for. Here it was 9 and 10, here it's 7, okay? Now, medial medullary syndrome is referring to the anterior spinal artery branches, okay? So remember, we said medial medulla, anterior spinal artery, lateral medulla uh, is going to be your pica. You see hypoglossal paralysis, it's game over, right? Cranial nerve 12, midline in the medulla, done. Okay, so you don't need to know all this other stuff. Contralateral hemiparesis, loss of vibration, proprioception. Now, it's good to know this other stuff when you're on the wards, and you can test for this stuff if you're on a neural rotation and look for a lot of that stuff. In general, right, it's going to be hypoglossal paralysis, and the game's over because you know it's going to, you know exactly where it's going to be. Okay, so going back to brainstem lesions, since we're talking about it, let's just talk about what happens when you knock out some of these cranial nerves. So cranial nerve three right, it's going to be most of your ocular muscles. So you're going to get your down and out pupil. And so remember, where's cranial nerve three? Midline, midbrain, right? Midline, midbrain. Now, the one thing that I want to say about this is a lot of times the pupil is not involved. And I'm going to talk about this in a minute as well. But when you have your cranial nerve three fibers along the top of the cranial nerve and the bottom of it too, actually, well, there's parasympathetic fibers and so if there's like a tumor or an aneurysm it will pinch the parasympathetic fibers first and as it grows it will push down on this nerve and eventually cause this down and out you know abducted eye however if there's a, pro a neurologic problem and it's not a mass pinching down on the nerve it usually is just going to give you the down and out and it won't give you the pupillary dilation right away and again remember that the fibers that are running on the oculomotor nerve or cranial nerve 3 are going to be fibers that help provide constriction, right? They're going to the sphincter pupillae. And so, like I said, when we knock those out, we can get pupillary dilation, usually from a mass or a tumor. So cranial nerve 4 is going to be your trochlear nerve. And so when we knock this out, we're knocking out the superior oblique muscle, which is responsible for the eye ability to look down, okay? So you can see here, this child is, you know, looking straight ahead but his left eye is going back up. In other words, the superior oblique is not able to pull uh, the eye down to look inferiorly. And so you can't look inferiorly. You also have a problem looking medially. So it's, this is particularly problematic when you're doing activities that require you to look down, like walking downstairs, for example, or if you're reading, for example. And so the classic thing to look for is head tilt away from the affected eye. So that this eye that is more functional 
can look down, right? And so you're going to tilt the head down so that the functional eye, the one that works, uh, and the one that doesn't have any palsy in it, can look down and see where you're going, okay? And so that's the concept, head tilt away from the affected eye classic for a trochlear nerve palsy. Cranial nerve 5, it has a motor nucleus, it has a sensory nucleus. Again, where's its location, right? It's 5, so it's in the pons. It's going to be lateral, not evenly divisible, right? So it has sensory and motor, and in general, you'll have weakness of the muscles and mastication ipsilaterally, typically, and then you'll also lose pain and temperature on that side of the face. Cranial nerve 6, uh, it's particularly high yield to know this one comes up a lot so this is your abducens nerve remember this is going to be going to be responsible for the lateral rectus muscle that allows you to abduct to the eye so you can see this person here you know this eye is the working eye right they're looking in but this eye should be looking out but it's not it's still stuck in the middle here and it should be a, a left abducens nerve palsy okay so cranial nerve seven ipsilateral facial weakness loss of taste of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue this sometimes gets asked about so it's good to remember that hyperacusis right there's actually a portion of the facial nerve that is going to run through the portions of the ear and the other thing is um, there's also parasympathetic fibers that run through the facial nerve as well for salivation lacrimation that kind of thing and really quickly what is hyperacusis because i feel like some people might not know so basically it's difficulty tolerating everyday sounds so someone might say that they have an uncomfortable sensation when they're simply having a conversation with their friends and there's really no loud sounds going on. So that's hyperacusis. Those sounds can be painful or even seem very loud when they're just, you know, normal frequency. Now we'll talk about the facial nerve in more detail in a little bit when we distinguish Bell's palsy from stroke. Okay, so for cranial nerve 8, you know, what I want you to kind of remember here is don't try and answer a problem based on the findings from cranial nerve 8 being knocked out. You know, if you, in terms of localizing a brainstem lesion because, you know, like we said, the, the uh, vestibular nucleus is mostly going to be in the medulla. The cochlear nucleus is actually technically in both in a lot of people. It's in the medulla and the pons. So it makes it very difficult. But if you had a lesion here, you would have ipsilateral deafness, vertigo, vomiting, nystagmus, right? And the other thing I want to say is also remember that you know, since we're talking about this, the area postrema is actually the center that when there's a defect there or there's a lesion there, I should say, you have uh, vomiting, a lot of vomiting. So that's why you get this, this vomiting here. And typically the area postrema is actually going to be in the medulla. Okay, so you can see this a lot with your lateral Wallenberg syndrome. Okay, so cranial nerve 9, glossopharyngeal nerve. Again, where is this going to be, right? You just got to kind of think about it. You know, it's going to be in the medulla, right? Not evenly divisible by 12, so it's going to be in the lateral medulla, right? Your Wallenberg syndrome. So weakness is swallowing, loss of taste in the posterior third of the tongue, and then cranial nerve 10, same place as cranial nerve 9, loss of gag reflex, lateral weakness of the palate. And then this is a really important one. You're going to have uvula deviation away from the side of the lesion, okay? And that's not to be confused with cranial nerve 12, which I'll jump to right now, which is gonna be ipsilateral weakness of the tongue with deviation toward the lesion. So if you have tongue deviation to the left, it's, it's usually a left-sided lesion, whereas with cranial nerve 10, if the uvula was deviated to the left, it would be a right-sided lesion, okay? And so just kind of keep that straight in your mind and remember that this is gonna be lateral medulla, medial medulla, okay? So pica, anterior spinal artery. All right, and then cranial nerve 11, ipsilateral weakness with head rotation and shoulder elevation, right? That's your accessory nerve, and this would be lateral medulla. And a fun fact, in case you get any questions about this, just remember that cranial nerve 1 is the only cranial nerve that does not have thalamic relay to the cortex. So just remember that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about brain herniation now. So in general, high intracranial pressures can lead to herniation of cerebral tissue. The high pressures can shift structures in the skull through uh, different areas, particularly through the foramen magnum, which would be down here. And that's particularly concerning. So what are some causes of this? A brain tumor can do this over a long period of time. Traumatic brain injuries can do this. Hemorrhage, right, bleeding, edema can all shift the brain tissue due to higher intracranial pressures. And that increase in intracranial pressure and that shifting of the cerebral contents can actually, if you have an artery in there, that can actually push down in the artery and actually cause an infarction. So it's, it's this is a very serious thing. So let's talk about some general clinical findings you might see in someone that has brain herniation. So I really want to talk about decorticate and decerebrate posturing. And sorry, this pixel this picture is a little pixelated, but you know you can see this too with uh, strokes as well. Okay, this is part of our uh, Glasgow Coma Scale. All right, but in general, for step one, what you really need to know is the difference between these two. So decorticate is more of the flex. Notice how his this person's hands are flexed here, right? Whereas here in decerebrate, they're extended, wrist is extended. So what does this mean? So 
essentially remember that the red nucleus or the rubrospinal tract is going to be in the midbrain. The rubrospinal tract is going to facilitate motor neurons in the cervical spinal cord that essentially, remember cervical, going to the upper extremities. And the rubrospinal tract is mostly going to be responsible for the flexor muscles. Okay, so the flexor. Now the rubrospinal tract is going to be in the midbrain. Okay, so pretty high up in the brainstem. If the lesion is above that area, above the midbrain, in other words, it's in the brain, then the rubrospinal tract is intact. So your flexors are still good. So you're going to get decorticate posturing or rigidity because the flexors are still intact this in this and you know in the setting of whatever lesion this is okay so you can still have decorticate rigidity so that's what this is telling you this is telling you that the region of the midbrain is still intact or at least the portion with the rubrospinal tract is still intact that's what this tells you in decerebrate rigidity the rubrospinal tract is no longer uh, working because there's a lesion that's at the rubrospinal tract or below it and so quite simply that flexion can no longer occur in the upper extremities so that's how you kind of distinguish the two. Is it more complicated than that? Yeah, it's definitely more complicated than that. Okay, this, there has to do with unopposed extensors and, and uh, the lateral cortical spinal tract. But really, for step one, if you can just remember that the rubro, the rubro spinal tract is responsible for the decorticate flexor portion of, of the rigidity you see here, and that it's in the midbrain, and that essentially the reason we even care about these two different forms of rigidity is because it tells us kind of in general sense where the lesion is not below the midbrain, below the midbrain, right? Or at the midbrain. So that's the whole concept of why there's such an emphasis placed on these two. Also remember, if there's medullary involvement, these patients might have intractable vomiting, again, because the area post is involved as well. So if you have intractable vomiting, you might be thinking area post involvement in the medulla. Some other findings, fixed pupillary dilation, right? This is gonna be more upstream, right? Because cranial nerve three uh, seizures, Okay, it's classic. And then Cushing's triad. This is something that you really want to make sure you're familiar with. And I'll tell you the way I remember it. Cushing's triad, the first part that I remember is that there's decreased respirations. Okay, so this is, I remember this as being an effect of brainstem dysfunction, right? Because that's where your respiratory center is. So if you have a defect in the brainstem, you can have respiratory uh, depression or a decrease in respiratory in respirations. So that's the first thing. You're, you're not breathing as fast. Okay, so if we're decreasing our respirations, we're blowing off less CO2, right? CO2 is ventilation dependent, okay? So CO2 causes vasodilation in the brain. That vasodilation increases the intracranial pressure in the brain. If you increase the intracranial pressure in the brain, remember, cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to the mean arterial pressure, or the MAP, minus the ICP. Now, if you increase the ICP because you have all this vasodilation from CO2 that you're retaining because you're not breathing fast enough, then you're increasing the ICP. What do you have to do to keep getting cerebral perfusion pressure? Increase the MAP, right? If you increase the MAP, that can counteract the increase in ICP from hypercapnia. So number two, you can have systolic hypertension, right? So you had decreased respirations. Now it's the second part. It's systolic hypertension compensating for the decreased respiration. Okay, now when you have hypertension, when your blood pressure goes up acutely, what happens to your heart rate? Drops, right? So you have bradycardia. So that's how I remember this, okay? And there's, that's, I just think about physiology and I feel like I can usually get to the right answer if I use physiology, using the rules of the game, right? So again, Cushing's triad, respiratory center is affected in the brainstem somewhere, right? And so because of that, decreased respirations, that leads to hypercapnia, cerebral vasodilation. That cerebral vasodilation is going to increase ICP. I need to increase the MAP so I can maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. I increase my systolic blood pressure to counteract that in the heart. I'm going to have a compensatory bradycardia. So that's how you remember Cushing's try. At least that's how I remember it. I don't know if that helps, but the other thing that you can sometimes see are these deray hemorrhages, which are these little hemorrhages they'll see like on an autopsy from increased intracranial pressure. I'm not going to go into great detail on that here, but um, that's also uh, something you might see in a board question if they're looking at like an autopsy. So first off, let's just talk about the classification of herniation. So there's tentorium, which is essentially this region here, okay? So it's a, a region that's separating the cerebellum from the cerebrum. Okay, so this is your tentorium. Now you can have supratentorial or infratentorial herniation. So supratentorial is the majority and refers to structures that are normally found above this tentorial notch, this region that separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. You can also have infratentorial, which are not quite as common. Okay, so most of these are going to be supratentorial herniations. 
So don't get confused if you see that term. It just means that it's above the tutorial notch, which is essentially above the cerebellum. So the first one we'll talk about is the uncle herniation, which is this one that you see here. Typically, it's the medial temporal lobe that's going to come down, push pressure down onto the midbrain, right? The midbrain is the most superior portion of the brainstem. So remember, what is in the midbrain? Cranial nerves three and four. If you knock out cranial nerve three, you're going to get your down and out appearance that we saw in the, in the previous slide. And again, because this is a herniation, the parasympathetic fibers might be affected. And so you might also get a pupil that dilates or a pupil that fails to constrict. So a down and out pupil that dilates and fails to constrict. However, remember, if it's an ischemic lesion, the pupil is usually spared and there's really no loss of accommodation or anything like that because, again, the parasympathetic fibers are running over the top of the oculomotor nerve and typically you need something compressive like a herniation or a tumor or an aneurysm to knock out that parasympathetic activity to cause fixed pupillary dilation. Classically, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but it's a posterior communicating artery aneurysm that causes a fixed dilated pupil. However, we'll talk about that a little bit more in, uh, in the aneurysm section. So that blown pupil that we were talking about from cranial nerve 3 is going to be mostly an ipsilateral because we're affecting that cranial nerve where it comes out. Because a lot of times we're going to be actually pinching down on the cranial nerve that's actually the portion of the cranial nerve that's going directly to the uh, innervate the muscles of the eye. Now you can also get a hemiplasia that's more contralateral. The midbrain is compressed. However, there's exceptions to this and there's something called Kernahan's phenomena where you can actually have an ipsilateral hemiplasia. So they're probably not going to ask you about which side the hemiplasia is on in a herniation, but just something to keep in mind. You can have it on either side. And then uh, the big thing here too is you're going to have decreased consciousness. And you want to remember that the reticular formation is responsible for consciousness and that can get impaired as well with an uncle herniation. And you can see here's an example of something that might actually cause an uncle herniation that being this uh, epidural hematoma here. The uncle herniation, classically remember your blown pupil. Now the central herniation is essentially um, a more advanced version of the uncle herniation. So the central can actually come from an uncle herniation. That's where you're actually going to have, uh, again, a transcentorial herniation similar to the uncle that takes a larger portion of the brain and brings it down through the frame and magnum. And usually this is going to be like both temporal lobes and possibly the diencephalon as well that gets herniated. And this is more severe because it's more brain tissue and so you can actually uh, have effects at the pons, down at the pons, particularly in functions of the basal artery from all this pressure that can lead to locked in syndrome which is like we talked about very severe and usually fatal. If it's a very mild central herniation it might just affect the abducens nerve. Remember the abducens nerve, cranial nerve 6, is also in the midline like cranial nerve 3 but the difference is cranial nerve 6 is a little bit further down and it's more associated with the central herniation. So lateral rectus palsy from a herniation is more associated with central herniation. Now this is not an image of lateral rectus palsy, but it is an image of sunset eyes that sometimes occurs in a setting of hydrocephalus or central herniation. It's not specific for central herniation, um, but it's something that you might see if there is a brain stem lesion or something causing increased intracranial pressure. Okay, so now the cingulate and the subphallocene herniation, that's going to be this one up here. So this structure up here is going to be your Felk's cerebri. Okay, so it's a, a portion of tissue that's running between these the two regions of the brain that are supplied by the anterior uh, cerebral artery, right? And when one hemisphere swells up from some pressure, you can push some of this tissue on one side of the brain to the other beneath the Sphelx cerebri. Now, in general, this doesn't put as much pressure on the brain or the brainstem particularly as these other two. However, this one classically will affect the anterior cerebral artery because remember, this is the area that's supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. And if you pinch down on one of these anterior cerebral arteries because of the increased pressure, that can cause infarction, right? Contralateral weakness of the lower extremities and loss of sensation. And there's also upward herniations, which is classically when the cerebellum will herniate upward from, you know, a tumor or something down here. And this is, would be an ascending to, uh, transcentorial herniation, but typically not as high yield. They don't really get asked about as much. Now, the other thing is the tonsillar herniation is when you have a herniation, a uh, downward herniation of the cerebellum. And this is classically taught, and this is classically referred to as the transforaminal herniation because you're going right through the frame and magnum. And um, the cerebellar tonsils can move down through the frame and magnum and also compress on the brainstem and the upper uh, cervical spinal cord. And this is sometimes referred to as your Chiari malformation. Now, Chiari malformations is more so of a structural defect that is characterized by downward displacement of these cerebellar tonsils. So you can see downward cerebellar tonsils, but those are your tonsillar herniations. And we're going to talk in the next slide in great detail about Chiari malformations. So in general, uh, we said Chiari malformations, we have a downward displacement of the cerebellar tonsils. And there are actually many more variants of the uh, Chiari malformations, but I'm just going to go through the big ones here, type 1 and type 2. 
So type 1 is the most common, asymptomatic in most children. Okay, it's not as uh, severe as the type 2, often manifests in adulthood with headaches, cerebellar symptoms. And essentially, it's basically from poor formation of the posterior fossa as a result of either congenital or acquired disorders, for example, like hydrocephalus, for example, resulting in this posterior displacement from the increased intracranial pressure. Um, neurofibromatosis can do it. Um, vitamin D resistant rickets can do it. So there's a lot of different things associated with type one. Um, but one that I really want you to remember is its association with connective tissue diseases, particularly Ehlers-Danlos and Marfan syndrome. And if you have a question on this, it's usually not gonna be a child. It's gonna be more so an adult that has headaches and um, they start to have like ataxia and some cerebellar symptoms. And you can see here in this image, and, and this is an adult, you can see that they have some herniation. Here's their cerebellum, here's your cerebral structures, here's your brainstem. You can see that they have a herniation of the cere uh, cerebellar tonsils going, pushing on the brainstem here. Okay, so that's essentially your Chiari malformation. The most high yield thing I saved here is this syringal amelia. And essentially, let's talk about that for a minute. So essentially, this is a cavitation within the spinal cord that surrounds uh, your spinal tracts. And so the big thing to remember is that your spinothalamic tract, when it comes in, you know, you have sensory receptors, right, that bring the pain and temperature information in, and then it goes up about two levels ipsilaterally from where it came in, and then it crosses uh, to the other side of the spinal cord via the anterior white commissure. So here you can see, right, the information comes in, it goes up about two levels, and then it crosses at this region here, this anterior white commissure, and then goes up. And you can see this happens at every level. It right? comes in, goes up a couple levels, and then it crosses at this region, the anterior white uh, commissure. So essentially in uh, syringomelia, the lesion is going to be right in the middle, okay, right where that uh, crossing occurs for the spinothalamic tract. So it's going to knock out the spinothalamic tract, your pain and temperature sensation. And usually, almost always, they're going to ask about this being in the cervical region. So it's primarily going to affect the pain and temperature sensation of the upper extremity. So they say that this is sometimes in a cape-like distribution, right? So if you're wearing a cape right on your shoulders, back of your arms, that's classically how this is going to present. So it's going to be an adult that we might not know has this herniation, and they're going to present with loss of pain and temperature sensation in this cape-like distribution. And maybe they have Marfan syndrome. Maybe they have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, right? Maybe they've been having headaches lately and some ataxia as well. And that's the kind of classic question you want to look at. And then when you scan them, you'll see that they have the syringomelia, for example. And remember that the proprioception in these patients is usually preserved, right? The dorsal columns is okay. So usually their vibration and proprioception will be intact. Now also, I wanna call your attention to, if the lesion's a little further down, like in the thoracic region, like T1 to T4 area, you can also have a Horner syndrome with this as well, if it gets big enough. So sometimes they'll present syringomelia with a Horner syndrome, but again, the classic board question is gonna be a young adult, late 20s, maybe early 40s. Most likely it's gonna be a male, with the classic findings listed. And if the anterior horns of the motor pathway are also involved, they might have some muscle weakness and atrophy, maybe a Horner syndrome, but classic findings is kind of what we talked about, the cape-like deficit of pain and temperature, headaches, cerebellar symptoms, and maybe they have a connective tissue disease. In those situations, you wanna get an MRI of the cervical and thoracic spine looking for syringomelia. And so here, I'll show you a picture of it here. You can see this cyst-like area that's lighting up. That is that cavitation within the spinal cord. Really quickly, type two Chiari malformations are sometimes referred to as the Arnold Chiari malformations. These in general are gonna have larger cerebellar displacement. Usually it's gonna present as when the child is very young or even as an infant and they're gonna have hydrocephalus, they're gonna have a lot of symptoms. It's not gonna be presenting as an adult most of the time. So that's kind of right off the bat how you can distinguish these two. This is gonna classically present with spina bifida with, uh, with meningeal myelocele. And we'll talk about what that is in a moment. The other thing is you'll a lot of times see a lateral rectus palsy. Again, like we talked about when you have the central herniations, um, you'll see that here as well. And then the sunset eye, as we talked about, with increased intracranial pressure, particularly in children or infants. So neural tube defects, big thing for neural tube defects is folic acid deficiency, vitamin B9. You can also see this with anti-seizure meds, particularly high to remember that velproic acid can also do this. But in general, your anti-eleptic meds, phenytoin, can also do this as well. And so we're talking about carry malformations, classically neural tube defects associated with type 2. If you have a defect of the rostral neuropore, we're talking about anencephaly, caudal neuropore, we're talking about spina bifida. So remember the three major types of spina bifida. Let's pull this up image up here. So, so really quickly though, going back to anencephaly for a second, I'll make sure I talk about this. So you're gonna look for increases in the AFP when you're doing your uh, prenatal testing. 
An ultrasound with an absence of brain or calvaria will also indicate anencephaly. And then these mothers will typically have polyhydramnios because there's no, uh, there's no ability to swallow the amniotic fluid. And so it'll build up. And again, anencephaly is not compatible with survival. Okay, now spina bifida occulta, the AFP is actually usually normal. They'll have a tuft of hair or a skin dimple typically here. Okay, so there's no herniation. You just have that tuft of hair. In the meningocele, you actually get herniation of the meninges, right? The dura, the arachnoid. In this case, you will usually have an increase in AFP, and you will also usually have an increase in AFP with uh, the myelomeningocele, which is your actual protrusion of the spinal cord. That's where you get the myelo. Milo is referring to spinal cord. And this is classically associated with the Chiari 2 malformations or the Arnold Chiari malformation. And so we already talked about this, tonsillar herniation, right? Classic for a Chiari malformation. And then the Dandy Walker malformation is when you have basically hypoplasia of the cerebellar vermis. Classically, these, in, these are going to be infants that present as well, and they might have hydrocephalus or paraplegia or coordination disorders. But make sure that you can identify the difference between a Chiari 2 malformation and a Dandy Walker malformation on imaging. So let's take a quick look. So here, remember, with Chiari malformations, we actually had the cerebellum herniating downward. But in this case, you just have this empty hyperlucency here. And this is basically all this empty space due to hypoplasia of the cerebellar vermis. Okay, and so you have significant dilation of your uh, fourth ventricle. So let's take another look at this here. You can see all of this empty space back here. So that's a Dandy Walker malformation. Hyper, hypoplasia of the cerebellar vermis is what you're looking for for Dandy Walker to distinguish it from the herniation you see with an Arnold Chiari malformation. Okay, guys, so now let's move on to talking a little bit about aneurysms. So what is an aneurysm? An aneurysm is a uh, round outpouching of a vessel essentially. And there's different types of aneurysms, but the big one that you really want to be familiar with here is the saccular or the berry aneurysm. So a berry aneurysm is different from some of the other aneurysms that we're going to talk about in that it typically happens at branch points when you have one vessel that's branching off to form you know, two other vessels or to form uh, a connected vessel. And at these points, there's a much higher probability that there could be potential rupture of the aneurysm. And so that's the major con concern. If this ruptures, then you can have bleeding into the brain. Typically, these are gonna arise at branch points, specifically at branch points in the circle of Willis. And they're much more prone to rupture than the fusiform aneurysms. And I'll just jump to fusiform here. These are essentially, the fusiform aneurysms are essentially when you have a circumferential widening. In other words, all the way around, you have a widening of a blood vessel, which is also prone to rupture, but not quite to the same extent as these, as these outpouchings that you get um, at branch points with berry aneurysms. So if you're still confused about this, look up some Google images of the two pictures and you can, you can see some examples. Now, the big thing to remember for the saccular aneurysms is that they are associated with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And that is particularly high yield to remember. Remember, the autosomal dominant form typically is going to present in an adult, whereas the autosomal recessive form will typically present more in a newborn or an infant. So if a young adult has an elevated creatinine but no history of chronic kidney disease, you know, maybe they're 20 or 30 years old and they have an elevated creatinine and they have a family history of sudden death from a brain bleed, you might be thinking that this person in a question stem might have autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Some other risk factors, so hypertension, right, high blood pressures at branch points can cause aneurysmal formation, smoking can weaken the elasticity of the vessel walls and then connected tissue diseases like Ehlers-Danlos for the same reason because the tissue wall compliance might be decreased and uh, due to decreased elasticity and you can get aneurysmal formation there as well. The saccular aneurysms can be divided into the location at, at which the saccular aneurysm is forming. Now two particular locations that sometimes get asked about is the anterior communicating artery and the posterior communicating artery. The anterior communicating artery aneurysms is actually the most common form of berry aneurysms, and so it gets asked about quite a bit, particularly because it it can impinge on the area of the optic chiasm. And like I said, we'll talk about visual field defects in a minute here, but if you impinge on the optic chiasm, right, if you put some pressure on the optic chiasm, you can get a bitemporal hemianopsia. Now, this is classically asked with pituitary adenomas or growth hormone tumors, prolactinomas, but it can also be asked about in the setting of an anterior communicating artery aneurysm. So just make sure you're familiar with that. Now, posterior communicating artery aneurysms are classically going to involve the oculomotor nerve. And remember, the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve 3, has parasympathetic fibers running above and below it. And if you put some kind of mass lesion, whether it be a tumor or an aneurysm, 
and you push down on the ocular motor nerve, the first thing to go are going to be the parasympathetic fibers. So you're going to get fixed pupillary dilation initially, and then you're going to have that down and out pupil once that mass or that aneurysm gets big enough to really push down all the way on that cranial nerve, which is cranial nerve three. Parasympathetic fibers are affected first by compression. So remember that. Now, if this aneurysm does rupture, we would consider it to be a subarachnoid hemorrhage, right? It's gonna be a, a bleeding into the brain beneath the layer of the arachnoid. So blood is gonna accumulate in the subarachnoid space. Now, when you have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, classically, this is a sudden onset thunderclap headache is how they describe it. It can be from head trauma, it can be from an aneurysm that burst, and it's, it's always usually described in a question stem as the worst headache someone has ever experienced in their life. And clinically, this is a question that sometimes you'll ask. Is this the worst headache you've ever experienced? This phrase in particular is classically associated with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, the initial test is going to be a non-contrast CT, and that's because you want to make sure there's no bleeding in the brain. So that's why you get it without contrast, because if you see uh, enhancement, you know that that's bleeding. And so that's classic for subarachnoid hemorrhage. So let's just see what a subarachnoid hemorrhage would look like. So here you can see this, this uh, enhancement filling the subarachnoid cisterns, which is this region right here. And then it's going it's extending, right, in these directions into the sylvian fissures and some of the other tissue here. But this enhancement that you see is blood or hemorrhage from a subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay? So this is the classic image you want to be familiar with when you see subarachnoid hemorrhage. Notice we're not looking at blood accumulating on the side of the brain like we would see with an epidural hematoma or with a subdermal hematoma. We're looking at the subarachnoid cisterns and the sylvian fissures specifically for enhancement, okay? So that's gonna tell you that it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And basically, in the emergency room, anybody that comes in with a really bad new acute onset headache and has any red flags or any history of trauma or falling and hitting their head, you pretty much order the non-contrast CT relatively routinely, okay? So it's the best initial test. Now let's just say that you really have a high index of suspicion in a board question. Maybe they say that this is the worst headache of this person's life. Maybe they have autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease or an elevated creatinine, but the head CT is negative. In those cases, you wanna do a lumbar puncture, okay? So the lumbar puncture would be the next test you would do if this was negative, but your suspicion was very high. On the LP, if you see red blood cells, or xanthochromia in the CSF, in a question stem, they're usually telling you that this is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So sometimes when an LP is done, you can actually get red blood cells in the CSF just because when you puncture that person, you might have hit like a couple capillaries or something like that. And so that would be considered more of a dirty tap. If you don't get any red blood cells, they call it a champagne tap. That's what it's referred to. But in a board question, if they give you red blood cells, they usually are telling you, hey, this is subarachnoid hemorrhage, or in the right clinical context, it could be like an HSV encephalitis, which will talk about in a moment. The xanthochromia is a yellow appearance to the centrifuged CSF. And so the idea here is, is that hemoglobin from the red blood cells is metabolized into bilirubin that gives it some of the yellow color. So be familiar with that term as well. Now, if in a board question, the person has a subarachnoid hemorrhage and it asks what's the next best step, typically you want to get this person a neurosurgery. Now, you know, in real life, you can use blood pressure medications that are more shorter acting potentially, or more of the IV medications like labetalol to get the pressures down immediately before you take them to neurosurgery or while you're waiting. But usually in a question stem, the best question is you gotta take this person to neurosurgery. Now I put on here also, uh, sometimes the neurosurgeons will order cerebral angiograms, and that's because ultimately they wanna see where the aneurysm was that burst, and the way to really fix this is to clip the aneurysms or do endovascular coiling. Now this is gonna be more of a step two thing, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but just for completeness, that's typically what they'll do when they go in there for uh, a surgical operation. Now, the thing that you really want to be familiar with, though, is the complications to subarachnoid hemorrhage. For some reason, this gets asked about all the time, and the major complication that you're concerned about after surgery or after bleeding in the brain is a cerebral vasospasm. So the idea here is you have some blood products that are released into the subarachnoid space. Now those blood products can stimulate tyrosine kinases, right? We're not supposed to have blood and hemoglobin in this space. And so that can stimulate tyrosine kinases that will cause a release of calcium ions. And we already talked about calcium a little bit before and its effects uh, in terms of ischemia on causing the mitochondria to cause apoptosis. But in this case, the other thing that calcium can do is it can actually cause smooth muscle contractions of the cerebral arteries. And this is particularly common in the setting of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so that can cause a vasospasm, which can lead to ischemia or stroke and decreased perfusion to a region of the brain. And so the way that you kind of uh, prevent that is you give nemotipine. Now, nemotipine is, of course, a calcium channel blocker. However, it has a very specific function. It's used specifically for these cerebral vasospasms.
and you can give this orally you can give it through an ng tube you know if the person still can't uh, take po meds but in general nimodipine is the drug that's given to prevent cerebral vasospasm that can lead to ischemia and a stroke secondary to a previous subarachnoid hemorrhage thing to remember is it doesn't prevent re-bleeding it prevents cerebral vasospasm so to prevent re-bleeding you want to keep the pressures a little bit lower so that there's not a really high mean arterial pressure that boom busts through that that uh, you know aneurysm or that clip that you just put in and causes another bleed and so for that reason you can give them labetalol or nicardipine which is also a calcium channel blocker but remember that these two drugs function to keep the pressures down to prevent re-bleeding whereas nimodipine is preventing the cerebral vasospasm so don't get nimodipine confused with nicardipine in the setting of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage Okay, let's just talk about this last one here, the Charcot-Bouchard microaneurysm. So essentially, like we said before, like we said before about strokes, there's the lenticulostriate arteries, which mostly supply the basal ganglia, uh, the thalamus, the pons, that region. Primarily, the basal ganglia is the one that classically is asked about. Again, chronic hypertension. When you think of, about your lacunar vessels, your lenticulostriate arteries, whether it be stroke or an aneurysm formation, you're going to be thinking about chronic hypertension, high pressures that cause lipohyalinosis, right? Weaken those vessel walls, cause fibrinoid degeneration, and eventually can cause an aneurysm or stroke in that area. So that's kind of that same concept. Those are called the Charcot-Bouchard microaneurysms, and those are classically associated with the lenticulostriate arteries, classically supplying the basal ganglia and its structures nearby. But since we're on the topic of cerebral bleeding, let's switch over to intracerebral hemorrhage. Now, um, lobar hemorrhage and intracerebral hemorrhage are actually in kind of the same category. Lobar hemorrhage is a subcategory of intracerebral hemorrhages where you have a bleeding into an entire lobe. Now, intracerebral hemorrhage is referring to when you have bleeds into the brain parenchyma. So that's a layer deeper than the subarachnoid space, right? This is actually into the brain tissue. And it's important to remember that this, like subarachnoid hemorrhage, is a medical emergency. Now, sometimes these are called hypertensive hemorrhages because hypertension is one of the most common causes of intracerebral hemorrhages. Really high pressures can cause bleeding into the brain. Classically uncontrolled hypertension or refractory hypertension. Like we just said, hypertension can cause lipohyalinosis of the lenticulostriate arteries, can cause Charcot-Bouchard microaneurysms, and both of, and those can actually lead to intracerebral, intracerebral hemorrhages when those burst. So those classically can lead to bleeding into the brain. So in this image, you can see that there's a large intraparenchymal hemorrhage that's involving the right basal ganglia. And you can even see a little bit of midline shift and some edema over here as well. And so this would be classic for an intracerebral hemorrhage, likely due to lenticulostriate artery aneurysm or a Charcot, Charcot-Bouchard aneurysm that has formed probably in a board question because of uncontrolled hypertension. And remember that the basal ganglia is the most common site when we're talking about lenticulostriate artery strokes, lacunar strokes, right, Charcot-Bouchard aneurysms, and intracerebral hemorrhages due to uncontrolled hypertension. So remember, basal ganglia is the most common location. And because of that, you should also know what happens if the basal ganglia is affected. So first off, let's just remind ourselves what the basal ganglia is. It's the combination of the putamen, the caudate, and the globus pallidus. So specifically, if the putamen is affected, you have a contralateral hemiparesis, right? So paralysis contralaterally typically, and you'll also usually have sensory loss if the putamen is affected. You can also have other symptoms like an homonymous hemianopsia, aphasia, neglect, but it's really important to remember these first two because those are those are the ones that are classically talked about when you're talking about uh, an infarction of the putamen or bleeding into the brain in that area. The caudate specifically, if it's exclusively involved, will only really give you contralateral hemiparesis, but it's usually not the case. So the big thing just to remember overall is that basal ganglia infarcts will classically present with contralateral hemiparesis and plus or minus sensory loss, okay? There are some exceptions to this, but that's kind of the general rule that you wanna think about when you're thinking about intracerebral hemorrhage or infarction in this area. So like we said, lobar hemorrhages are a form of intracerebral hemorrhages. When you see lobar hemorrhages in a question stem, you wanna think immediately about amyloid angiopathy, especially if they say that an entire there's bleeding into an entire lobe of the brain. Now it can also be due to hypertension because we said hypertension is one of the most common causes of intracerebral hemorrhages and lobar hemorrhages is a subtype of that category but a lot of times when they ask about lobar hemorrhages they're referring to amyloid angiopathy 
So classically, you want to think about an older patient, at least 50 years old, usually older than that. And these patients will have amyloid deposits inside of the vessel walls that make the vessel very fragile and prone to bleeding. The symptoms that they have will, again, totally depend on which lobe is involved, right? You can have different symptoms if the frontal lobe is involved versus the occipital lobe or the parietal lobe. And I'll go over all the uh, dysfunctions at the different lobe sites towards the end of this lecture. So in this image, we can see a very large hematoma that is in the right frontal lobe. And again, a lot of midline shift here. Uh, pushing down on the ventricles as well. So that would be an example of a lobar hemorrhage. Okay, so epidural hematomas. This is a particularly high yield topic that I feel like everyone should have some basic understanding about. So the first thing is, remember, it's classically caused because of rupture of the middle meningeal artery. But the big thing that they ask about nowadays is that they feel like, you know what, everybody already knows this, but do they know that it's a branch of the maxillary artery? So remember, it's a branch of the maxillary artery, and sometimes that's, that's how they're going to ask this question. And this classically is going to happen due to a temporal bone fracture. Classically, the uh, terion is going to be fractured in the temporal lobe, and that will damage the middle meningeal artery that's running through that area and cause a bleed into the epidural space. So because this is an arterial bleed, this is going to be a rapidly expanding hematoma that forms in the epidural space. And again, when we say epidural space, we're talking about the skull and the dura, right? So it's forming in between those two, and that's where the middle meningeal artery initially was running, right along the skull. So if you have a fracture there, you can lacerate the artery and then cause bleeding into that space. Now, the way that this classically gets asked about is there is a lucid interval. So what does that mean? That means there's a period of time where there's no symptoms as the hematoma starts to grow. So here's how they kind of write it. So these, it's going to be, you know, some, some patient that, um, you know, had some trauma and they lost consciousness, but then they regained consciousness and then they felt fine. They felt like themselves, but then they start decompensating again. Maybe they're getting confused. Maybe they lose consciousness again. So one common symptom that uh, starts to come up in, in those cases, typically when they re-experience symptoms, is that they're going to have that down and out pupil, largely due to the effects of an uncal herniation that is caused by this rapidly expanding hematoma, pushing portions of the temporal lobe inferiorly, potentially transtentorally, inferiorly into the foramen magnum. And eventually that increase in intracranial pressure from the expanding hematoma can cause that herniation to happen. To manage this, typically neurosurgeons will do a craniotomy to evacuate the hematoma and release some of that pressure. And while you're waiting for neurosurgery, usually you can you can just drill a hole in the in the skull just to relieve pressure temporarily if you're if you have to wait for some period of time. Okay, so subdural hematomas, uh, again classically head trauma, elderly and alcohol. Those are the three big things for subdural hematomas. And these are due to rupture of the bridging veins. So again, subdural, so we're talking about the layer deep to the epidural space, okay? So between the dura and then the arachnoid. Now there's different forms of subdural hematoma. There's chronic and acute forms. Now when they ask about chronic subdural hematomas, these are typically elderly patients. They really didn't have any new trauma, right? They can, they could, they could have fallen or something like that, but usually that will be a more acute uh, presentation. So some elderly patients, they may have like vague symptoms for a few weeks or a few days where they've been more unsteady on their feet and they have a headache. And maybe they had a new seizure recently and now they have some focal neurologic deficits. Okay, so very vague symptoms initially, and uh, those patients, you take a picture of the brain, and you can see that, you know, they might have had a sub, uh, subdural hematoma, for example. And that's classic in the elderly population. Now, the acute subdural hematomas are more so associated with the trauma. So, right, some kind of trauma caused rupture of these bridging veins, and that caused bleeding into the subdural space. The acute subdural hematomas will present usually with a more severe kind of headache. They'll be vomiting. There might be um, some cranial nerve palsies, and all of this is going to happen very acutely after the trauma. Now, in both cases, usually you'll see the crescent-shaped hematoma. Here you can see this convexity. This is your epidural hematoma, right? Bleeding into the brain from the middle meningeal artery. And then here you can see the more crescent shape of the uh, subdural hematoma. And you can see some pretty significant midline shift here as well uh, with the subdural hematoma. So it's really important to make sure that you're familiar with these two images. And once you feel comfortable with these two and their general presentation, then I would say uh, make sure you're able to also identify the intracerebral hemorrhage as well. Okay, so let's just go through the uh, visual field defects here really quickly. Now, the one thing I really want to call your attention to before we even start this, there's two visual fields for each eye. You have your nasal, which is going to be more medial, and you have your temporal visual field. Okay, now when the light comes in from the temporal visual field, it's going to land on the nasal retina. Comes in on a diagonal. So temporal visual field, nasal retina. Nasal visual field, temporal retina. When they ask questions, make sure that you identify, are they talking about the visual field or the retina? 
because the temporal visual field is going to go to the nasal retina. The nasal visual field is going to go to the temporal retina. That's how they get you in questions. They might be talking about the retina and not the visual field. Okay, so you'll see what I'm talking about, but make sure you distinguish those. So, for example, temporal visual field is going to bring light into the nasal retina. Nasal retina is going to bring in those fibers, and those fibers are going to cross at the optic chiasm and go to the contralateral side. That means that everything from the temporal visual field is going to go to the contralateral part of the brain. That means that everything from the nasal retina is going to go to the contralateral brain. So make sure you're familiar with that. Temporal visual field, nasal retina, contralateral brain. Nasal visual field is going to go to the temporal retina, and that is going to go to the same side of the brain. That being said, let's say that you just cut the optic nerve right where uh, these fibers come together, right behind the eyeball. Okay, so you cut that, you're going to have complete vision loss. So you cut the optic nerve, complete unilateral blindness. Now, if you cut the region at the optic chiasm, okay, so this is not a really good depiction of it because it looks like they're cutting everything, but let's just say that you had something at the optic chiasm that was pressing down on it or a lesion there that would cause a bitemporal hemianopsia in other words the peripheral fields like you can see here will be blocked off because those are the fibers right that's this nasal retinal fiber that was giving light from the temporal visual field is now impinged okay so that gives you a bitemporal hemianopsia classically due to optic chiasm compression from pituitary adenomas growth hormone tumors, prolactinomas, and think about how they're going to ask this, right? Usually it might be like a, a young child, maybe it's acromegaly, right? Uh, maybe they have really high IGF-1 levels, okay? So just try and put the pieces together and think about how they would ask these kind of questions. And I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole in this lecture just because we don't have time, but but um, classically, bitemporal hemianopsia is going to be pituitary adenomas. Now I also said it can be from an anterior communicating artery aneurysm. So make sure you're familiar with that as well. Nasal hemianopsia. So this nasal is referring to the, the visual field, not the retinal fibers. Okay. Um, so again, so nasal hemianopsia, your nasal visual field, which is medial, right? It's going to be here. It's going to come in. Here's your nasal visual field. It comes into this portion of the eye, which is the temporal retina. Those fibers are not going to cross, right? They're just going to go straight back to the same side of the brain. And let's say there was a lesion down here, right? Where those fibers start to come down. And, I and it's not depicted on this image, but essentially, if, th if just those fibers were nicked, you would have a unilateral nasal hemianopsia. And you can look that up. Okay, so that would be a nasal hemianopsia. So just the nasal visual field of one eye is affected. That would happen if you had calcification of the internal carotid arteries. If you had bilateral calcification of the internal carotid arteries, then you can have a bilateral nasal or binasal hemianopsia, okay, which would be the opposite of the bitemporal hemianopsia. Literally, it would be the opposite of this image here. You just have black in the middle, white on the ends. So now there's homonymous hemianopsia. So homonymous means that in both eyes, it's the same side, right or left, that's affected. The thing that's interesting here is you can actually get homonymous hemianopsia a lot of different ways. You want to pay attention to if they give you macular sparing or not. Okay, now if they don't give you macular sparing, usually they're talking about the optic tract that is getting damaged. So once my temporal visual field fibers or my nasal retinal fibers, which would be here, okay, once those fibers cross, they're going to combine with the nasal visual field and temporal retinal fibers of this side. Okay, so these blue fibers and these red fibers will then come together, right, on this side. And once I nick that, I'm going to lose my nasal visual field of the left eye and my temporal visual field of the right eye, which would give me a contralateral hemianopsia. In other words, I nicked the left optic tract and now I can't see out of my right side. That's why it's called a contralateral homonymous hemianopsia, okay? No macular sparing, though, all right? Macular sparing is when you have the center of the eye, uh, you're still able to see. So you, you don't have that happening here. It's complete homonymous hemianopsia if you nick the optic tract. And again, that's because you have the fibers that are coming from, and you know, if you nick the left optic tract, you have the fibers that are coming from the temporal visual field on the right and the nasal visual field on the left coming together and they're both going to get nicked at this spot. And now you can't see on the right half of each eye. Okay. I know that's really confusing. So maybe watch this back. Hopefully I said all of this right. If I didn't guys, 
put a comment down there and I'll, I'll see if I can fix it. Okay, so now what about homonymous hemianopsia with macular sparing? So if there's a posterior cerebral artery infarction, right, in the occipital lobes, that classically will produce homonymous hemianopsia with macular sparing in a board question. Now it doesn't always have to be macular sparing, but usually that's how they ask it. And usually it's contralateral occipital lobe. So again, same concept as this. If you nick the left optic tract, you can't see out of the right half of the eye. If you have an infarction in the left occipital lobe, usually you can't see out of the right half of the eye, but you might have macular sparing, as you can see here. Okay, homonymous inferior quadrantopsia and superior quadrantopsia. So this comes into play. Once these fibers from the optic tract come together, they're going to go to the lateral geniculate nucleus, which you can also have lesions at, but that gets really tricky because then you can have sector opsias, and I'm not going to go through all of that. It's beyond the scope of step one, two, or three, so we're not going to talk about that. Um, but once it goes from the lateral geniculate nucleus, it actually kind of splits off into what we call radiations. Okay, so we go to the optic tract, to the lateral geniculate nucleus, and now we're splitting off into radiations. Some of the radiations are going to go up superiorly, and some of the radiations are going to go down inferiorly. If we go up, we go to the parietal lobe. If we go down, we go to the temporal lobe. So when we go up, when those fibers go up, they're going to go to the parietal lobe. And remember, everything is kind of flipped in the brain, right? The information that's coming in, that's eventually going to get processed here in the occipital lobe, it's all kind of flipped. So the stuff that goes up, in other words, the fibers, the radiations that go up into the parietal lobe, will cause an inferior quadrantopsia. So a contralateral, right, because it's on the opposite side. So the contralateral superior optic radiations that are through the parietal pathway, the radiations that went up, are going to cause a homonymous inferior quadrantopsia. These fibers from the optic tract, half of them, a quadrant of them, went up, and those ones that went up are going to cause an inferior quadrantopsia because I remember everything's flipped in the brain so that's kind of the way to remember that these fibers from the optic tract that decided to radiate downwards into the temporal lobe right if those just get nicked then there it's going to be a superior quadrantopsia right because everything's flipped so the stuff in the parietal lobe is going to cause the inferior quadrantopsia the stuff in the temporal lobe is going to cause a superior quadratopsia, and it's going to be a contralateral hemianopsia like we saw here. So if you nick, if you have a uh, stroke or HSV encephalitis, <clears throat> something in the temporal lobe that goes awry, if it's in the left temporal lobe, for example, it is going to affect the right superior quadrant side of your vision, like you can see here. Okay, so that's the concept. And then the, the temporal lobe, the inferior optic radiations that cause the superior quadrantopsia are uh, classically in an uh, area called Myers loop. So they form the Myers loop. And if you have a bitemporal superior quadrantopsia, guys, I've said it before, and for some reasons they love to ask about this, herpes encephalitis, right? HSV encephalitis classically in the temporal lobe. If both temporal lobes are affected, this classically presents as Kluver-Busey syndrome. Kluver-Busey syndrome has some cardinal symptoms. One is hyperorality. Um, it has impulsivity, hypersexuality, amnesia. Now, you might be thinking, wow, that sounds a lot like frontotemporal dementia. And remember the name, frontotemporal dementia, temporal, temporal lobe atrophies. And so that's why you have the personality changes, the hyperorality. You get a lot of these same symptoms with frontotemporal dementia because, again, it's the same area that's affected. So Guillain-Barre syndrome, also known as acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy. Um, Guillain-Barre is the most common form of AIDP due to inflammatory demyelination of the peripheral nerves. So when we say peripheral nervous system, we're talking about the Schwann cells. And the Schwann cells are targeted due to molecular mimicry from self-antigens, usually from a previous infection. So in these patients, what do you want to look for? They're going to tell you this person just got over, you know, a diarrheal illness, or they just had a GI illness, or they had a really bad upper respiratory infection two weeks ago, right? And now they have these neurologic symptoms. So that's classic for Guillain-Barre, especially if they mention that they had a Campylobacter or a mycoplasma pneumonia infection, that pretty much seals the deal. So you're going to look for symmetric weakness beginning in the distal limbs, right? When you think of like botulism and that kind of, you're thinking more of weakness beginning more cephalad, whereas in this condition, you're thinking of symmetric weakness beginning in the distal limbs, ascending up. So that's why sometimes it's called an ascending paralysis. And you can also have autonomic symptoms. For example, you can have tachycardia, they can be bradycardic, they can have urinary retention, uh, ileus, orthostatic hypotension, but it's hard to really pin down this disease just based off of those factors. So again, look for the symmetric weakness in the limbs and look for a history of previous infection. In real life, back when I was in med school and uh, we were on neurology rotations, um, you know, when we suspected Guillain-Barre, the biggest thing was 
you know, what are their reflexes like? So if they have decreased or absent reflexes, that's pretty classic for Guillain-Barre syndrome. So that's something that they're usually also going to give you in a question to help tailor this answer. So the big thing, though, is the albuminocytologic disassociation. So I talked about this briefly in the meningitis video I did on the 200 high yield facts lecture, but essentially this is when you have uh, increased uh, CSF protein with a normal cell count that you can differentiate this from meningitis because meningitis, even in viral meningitis, usually you expect an elevated white blood cell count. It might not be to the same extent as bacterial. However, in the setting of Guillain-Barre, we expect a normal white blood cell count with elevated protein. So that's the albuminocytologic dissociation. Albumino meaning the protein is up, cytologic meaning the white blood cells are normal. So there's a dissociation between those two suggestive of this disease. The biggest thing you worry about with this disease is because it's ascending, if it gets to the respiratory muscles, the person can have respiratory failure and that can be life-threatening. So again, consider pulmonary function testing, um, you know, at, to get a baseline and then you want to serially check spirometry in these patients. And then in terms of treatment, you can do plasmapheresis or IVIG. I think it's pretty equivocal in terms of which one is better. Okay, so then you have your Charcot-Marie tooth disease. This is also known as hereditary motor and sensory neuropathy. This one's classically due to mutations that affect the neuron proteins that are in the myelin sheath of the peripheral nervous system. So again, peripheral nervous system, again, in most cases are due to defects on chromosome 17. It's not particularly high yield to know that, but if you have some room left in your brain, you can put that in there. The big thing that I really want you to remember is foot drop is usually an initial symptom that presents very early in the disease process. It's not specific for this disease, right? There's a lot of ways you can get foot drop. Again, going back to your anatomy, what nerve is primarily responsible for the dorsiflexion of the foot that would prevent foot drop? The answer to that is the common fibular nerve. Okay, and remember, taking it a step further, what's the primary muscle? You should definitely know this if you do any ortho rotations, and that's tibialis anterior. So these patients will classically have lower leg atrophy that's sometimes referred to as the inverted bottle appearance. So if you take a bottle and you flip it over, how the bottle kind of comes and narrows, that's what they're referring to. So it's that atrophy because the peripheral nerves are affected in this region. And it's all about the foot. It's all about foot deformities. We said foot drop. You can have a very high arch. You can have hammer toes, again, diminished or absent reflexes, again, because we're affecting the peripheral nervous system. You, lower motor neurons usually. They can also have decreased vibration and proprioception sense as well. Okay, let's move on to PML. PML is a life-threatening disease caused by reactivation of the JC virus. That's probably the most important thing I can tell you about it, but I'll give you some additional information. So it's more of a central nerve demyelination as opposed to the peripheral nerve diseases that we talked about here. Most individuals will get infected with JC virus, but they'll get it in like childhood and then it'll remain dormant in their kidneys or their lymphoid tissue. And most people are just asymptomatic. But those that have severe immunocompromise, those are the people that are at risk for reactivation. So these patients will present with subacute neurologic deficits. So these patients will have worsening, you know, paralysis on one side of the body. Um, they'll have ataxia. They'll be very confused, altered mental status. And so if you do CT imaging, a lot of times they'll ask about this in terms of how you differentiate PML from some of these other diseases just based off CT imaging. In reality, most of the time you want to do MRI because MRI can give you more visualizations of structures in the brain typically. It's not as good for detecting bleeds, but overall um, MRI is the way to go. But on CT imaging, how do you distinguish some of these different diseases? So PML versus toxo versus primary CNS lymphoma. So for PML, you have white matter lesions with no enhancement or edema. Okay, so let's take a look here. So here's an example of PML. See, there's really no enhancement, but you have some lesions in the area of the white matter, and you can see this blacked out space, but no enhancement at all. Now, toxo is the most common uh, central nervous system infection in untreated AIDS patients. And so this is going to present with multiple ring enhancing lesions with edema. So you can see here we have multiple ring enhancing lesions and see they're enhancing. We have this white enhancement under all of these lesions and then this black kind of hypodense region around them, that's the edema. Okay, so multiple ring enhancing lesions with edema as compared to these lesions in the white matter with no enhancement or edema. If you compare that to primary CNS lymphoma, the difference here is we only have one well-defined single lesion, and it's classically going to be an enhancing focal lesion. So you can see the enhancement here, and you have a little bit of edema on the outside here as well. And again, this is also going to be an immunocompromised patient. If they tell you that they've extracted Epstein-Barr virus DNA in the CSF, that is going to be very specific for this disease process in particular. That is the primary CNS lymphoma. Okay, so metachromatic leukodystrophy, this is an autosomal recessive lysosomal storage disorder. I've talked about this before in many videos, but essentially this is due to a deficiency of aryl sulfatase A and you have a buildup of cerebroside sulfates. You really just memorize a lot of this. The concept here is the sulfatides basically build up, they cause myelin breakdown, and there's very 
various forms of this disease process. If they ask you about in the question stem, it's usually the late infantile form. So you usually have uh, difficulty walking at the end of the first year of life in an infant. And uh, symptoms tend to involve like muscle weakness, rigidity, it can be blindness. You're usually not expected to identify like any key symptom, but you really should know the enzyme and the byproduct buildup. Finally, for central pontine myelinolysis, so the way that this is classically asked about is a patient that was hyponatremic and you overcorrected or too rapidly corrected the hyponatremia. The opposite of this is the osmotic demyelination syndrome, um, but just for the sake of the uh, central pontine myelinolysis, essentially what we're worried about here is the locked-in syndrome that we talked about before due to brain herniation from the overcorrection. And typically you'll lose your cortical spinal tracts, your cortical bulbar tracts, right? You can have paralysis, quadriplegia, like we talked about before, depending on how bad the herniation is. But if you end up with locked-in syndrome, remember you're able to retain vertical uh, movements of the eye and you're also able to preserve consciousness for some period of time but usually there's paralysis of like your cranial nerves and and uh, muscle movements and sensory loss okay so for ms again another demyelinating disease this is due to destruction of oligodendrocytes so that tells you it's central nervous system so the pathology here is you have your cd8 and your T helper 1 and T helper 17 helper C cells that are basically destroying the oligodendrocytes in the CNS. And there are surrogate markers for the disease. And when I say surrogate, I mean that it's a it's an antibody that you can draw, but the antibody usually is not the thing doing the damage. It's the T cells, specifically the CD8 and some of the helper T cells that are causing most of the damage. But there's also elevation of these anti-myelin basic protein antibodies in the setting of MS. So for the anti-MBP antibodies, this is like if you do an LP and you know you find high levels of these IgG antibodies in the CSF, then that's suggestive of MS. Now, classically, though, when we're doing an LP and we're looking at the CSF analysis, we're usually looking for oligoclonal IgG bands, and that's particularly high yield to remember. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Let me go back. What happens here is due to the destruction of the oligodendrocytes, over time, you have white matter plaques that accumulate in the brain and the spinal cord due to the demyelination. And this is classically going to be in, in usually in Caucasian women between 20 and 25, usually temperate climates. There's some papers that try to associate vitamin D deficiency with MS. It's just because it happens more frequently. You know, in the U.S., it happens more frequently in the northern U.S., um, but there's still some limited evidence as to some of these things. Uh, classically associated with the HLA-DR2. So the presentation is going to be most commonly the relapsing remitting form. So what that means is the course of symptoms basically present with these sudden attacks and then these relapses or periods of time where there's an improvement in symptoms. And that's usually the case. And that's usually how they ask about it. There's also going to be progressive forms where the person just keeps getting worse over a period of time, but that's more uncommonly asked about. So the idea here is, and this is classically how it's described, is that you have a person that has neurologic symptoms that are separated by time and space. What they mean by that is over some period of time, the person improved and then got neurologic symptoms again, and then they improved and got symptoms again. That's the time. The space is where the lesion is. The lesions are in different areas, right? You might have, you know, plaques in the occipital lobe at one point, and you might have plaques periventricularly, and then you might have plaques on the spinal cord in all different places. So that's time and space. Lesions separated by time and space. Now, what are some of these lesions that are classically asked about? The first one is optic neuritis. So optic neuritis is sudden vision loss. It can be painful when you move the eye. Um, you also can see the Marcus gun pupil, which is an afferent pupillary defect. So what does that mean exactly? So if you shine some light into the eye, right, normally you expect a cascade to occur. I'm not going to go through all the mediators here, but when you shine light into the eye, you expect the pupil to constrict. And not only this pupil, but you also expect the contralateral pupil to constrict. And that's because that signal is being sent not only to this eye to, be, to constrict, but also it's being sent to the opposite eye to constrict as well. For whatever reason, you have an optic neuritis, an issue with cranial nerve two, you can't bring this signal in, right? Because you have a lesion here. So if you can't bring this signal in because there's demyelination, then neither eye is going to get the signal to constrict. So that's the concept. So a afferent defect would prevent constriction of both pupils. And that's classically the Marcus gun pupil. You can also see the Marcus gun pupil in conditions like glaucoma or just the general cranial nerve 2 lesion, but it's mostly associated with MS, especially in board questions. The other thing is the internuclear ophthalmoplegia, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then you can also have um, your usual symptoms. Again, these are not as specific, though. Hemiparesis, uh, sensory loss, a, mix, a mixture of the upper and lower motor neuron lesions, depending on what fibers are affected. 
Um, but again, like I said, in a board question, they might have those symptoms, but it's not specific, right? It's not going to tell you it's MS, whereas the optic neuritis and Marcus Gunn pupil are more classically associated with this disease. That's really classically associated with this disease process is heat sensitivity or the Uthoff phenomena. So this is essentially temporary worsening of symptoms when you're exposed to increased temperatures. So this might be someone who just took a really hot shower and all of a sudden they have ptosis or they can't see out of their left eye or they have sensory loss on the right side of their body. Something like that. That's the Uthoff phenomena, and this is actually asked about all the time, so make sure you're familiar with that. You can also have bowel or bladder incontinence, you know, like a young 26-year-old female who has uh, new onset uh, bladder incontinence, urinary incontinence. You know, if she doesn't have a UTI, then you're probably thinking that she might have MS, okay? And then your Lermit sign, which is essentially an electric shock that radiates down the spine uh, when you do flexion of the neck. Okay, or it can radiate down the limbs too. Okay, so when you diagnose this, like we said, LP with a little clonal bands is classic. Uh, possibly you might see your anti-MBP protein as well. The leukocytes could be elevated, but usually the glucose levels are normal, so that's usually how you differentiate the CSF findings from meningitis. So and to diagnose this with imaging, like we said, you have to have evidence of demyelinating disease disseminated in time and space. So you have to have multiple images, multiple pictures of the brain that show the lesions at different places at different times. And this is the classic image that you're gonna see when they talk about MS, sometimes called uh, Dawson's fingers, and it's essentially uh, demyelinating periventricular plaques on your T2 flare image, okay? So make sure you're familiar with that picture as well. And you can see some lesions here as well. Now, in terms of treatment, there are a lot of different options, and treatment is, isn't really discussed that much on step one. It's talked about more in step two, and because I have so much information in this video, I decided to kind of run over this really quickly. Um, but essentially it's immunosuppressive therapy and there's maintenance therapy and there's also therapy that can be used more acutely um, like high dose steroids for example will be used more acutely now the natalizumab and the rituximab these are classic for agents that can cause pml in fact i think i kind of skipped over that so let me so going back to our previous slide really quickly um, natalizumab and rituximab or patients that have a cd count cd4 count less than 200 or recent organ transplant are at particularly high risk of pml when you see someone on either one of these two drugs, you want to make sure in your mind that this question is not asking about PML before you go any further. Okay, going back to where we were, so remember if you treat somebody on uh, with MS with one of these two drugs, you can cause, potentially cause, uh, PML due to the immune suppression. Finally, internuclear ophthalmoplasia, which is essentially impaired conjugate lateral gaze. So let's take a look. Okay, so here's this person's baseline. They're just looking straight at you. Now we tell this person, hey, look to your right. So they look to their right, everything's fine. Now we say, hey, look to your left. When they look to the left, one eye is okay, but this eye is not moving. So what's going on? So this is a disorder of conjugate lateral gaze. They can't look completely to the left with both eyes. Okay, so let's see what's happening. So the affected eye is unable to adduct on contralateral gaze. So that would be this eye in this case, right? This eye is not able to adduct on contralateral gaze. When we tell them to look left, the right eye cannot. So what happens? So here, again, now we're looking at this kind of flip the other way. So this is the person's right eye, this is their left eye, and we're telling them to look left. So this was the eye that was affected. It was the right eye, couldn't move. So what happened? So to understand this, you kind of have to understand this pathway, so to speak. So the paramedian pontine reticular formation, we just call it PPRF, is going to send a signal from the brain, and that's going to tell two major centers to move with conjugate gaze, essentially. So let's look at the easy side first. So it's going to tell the abducens nucleus, okay, the abducens nucleus, we want the abducens nerve to pull, to tell the lateral rectus muscle to move this eye to the left, okay? So it's gonna engage the lateral rectus muscle and the eye's gonna move left, okay? So notice this is ipsilateral, okay? So the PPRF is on the same side as this eye here, and it's gonna connect to the abducens nucleus and cause this to abduct, abduct. On the other side of the abducens nucleus, there's a set of fibers that are running up to the oculomotor nucleus, okay? This is the MLF, the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Now what's important to remember about this MLF is that it's heavily myelinated okay very heavily myelinated so if you have a demyelinating disorder particularly of the central nervous system this is one of, one of the areas that is commonly affected because it's so heavily myelinated so we'll see what this does here so this the mlf takes that signal to, brings it to the contralateral side of the brain to the oculomotor nucleus and tells the medial rectus muscle to also engage in a deduction of the right eye so both eyes can move together so on one side ipsilaterally you're um, abducting, and then contralaterally, you're adducting this eye, okay? Now, if this was demyelinated or there was a lesion here, then you wouldn't be able to tell the oculomotor nucleus to cause a deduction of the right eye. And if this couldn't adduct, what happens? You get what you see right here. You get this guy's 
abducens nerve is able to have the lateral rectus to cause abduction, but his oculomotor nucleus is not being stimulated by the MLF, and so for that reason, this eye is sitting still. Okay, and so that's essentially what happens. Now, when this happens, the reaction by the body, it kind of doesn't know what's happening because it, it's getting mixed signals. So the unaffected eye, the one that's working the way it should, is then going to undergo nystagmus because it's going to start to kind of bounce back and forth to because the eye is going to be trying to reestablish uh, equilibrium, so to speak, because of the mixed signals that are that are the eye is getting in. So, so the unaffected eye, is, that AB ducts, is the one that has the nystagmus. And remember, this is due to dysfunction of the medial longitudinal fasciculus. And it's, this is not specific to MS. However, it is commonly asked about with MS. So just be familiar with that as well. Okay, so for spinal cord injury, we have upper motor neuron signs and lower motor neuron signs. So let's talk about these really quickly. So upper motor neuron signs, classically going to be your hyperreflexia, clonus, spasticity. And that's because the upper motor neurons aren't able to provide negative inhibition to the lower, lower motor neurons. So the lower motor neurons are just constantly being stimulated, um, causing some of these symptoms where you see like an overstimulation, which gives you the hyperreflexia, the spasticity. Um, you can also see the Babinski sign, sometimes referred to as the extensor plantar reflex, right? Um, or the upgoing plantar reflex where the toes go up. Remember, that's normal in infants, but it's not normal uh, in adults, right? And then your pronator drift is also an upper motor neuron sign where you have them close their eyes, put their uh, hands out like they're holding uh, bowls of soup. And uh, if their hands start to turn in, that would be an upper motor neuron sign. Okay, lower motor neuron signs is weak. This is literally if you're clipping or cutting the nerve that directly supplies the muscle, right? That's going to be weakness because now you have no signals coming in. As opposed to if you clip the upper motor neuron, the lower motor neuron still connected. There's just no inhibition. That's why it's causing hyperreflexia and spasticity with upper motor neuron lesions. The lower motor neuron lesions, you're cutting the nerve that literally innervates that muscle. So the muscle is not going to get innervation, right? So that's weakness, wasting, atrophy, absent, reduced reflexes, fasciculations, because you're just getting a, you know, a little bit of a signal, but you're not getting a full signal. So that's why you're getting the, uh, the fasciculations. And then again, a negative Babinski sign if it's just a lower motor neuron lesion. To understand these spinal cord lesions, you have to just have some basic understanding of the tracks, okay? You don't have to know everything. You just have to have some basic understanding. Okay, so nociceptors, thermoreceptors. So we're talking about the spinal thalamic tract. So we have, you know, we put, just put our hand on the hot plate. So what's going to happen? We have a first order neuron. It's afferent. It's bringing a signal into the dorsal root ganglia, right? That's where the um, cell uh, body is. It's going to come in, right, dorsally and it's going to synapse onto a second order neuron. Now, here's what you have to remember. The spinal thalamic tract will go up one or two levels before it crosses over, okay? Before it decussates. That's what I, and decussation is just crossing over, right? It's gonna come in, it's gonna go up one or two levels. If it comes in at T10, go up to T8, right? Right around there, and then it will cross. And when it crosses, it's gonna go through the anterior white commissure, which is this thing right here. And it's going to cross over as a second order neuron and then it's going to go up 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 uh, through the medulla and eventually synapse in the thalamus where it's going to go to the primary somatosensory cortex and our brain will tell us based on that information oh that's a hot plate let me stimulate the corticospinal tract or you know whatever it is if you put your hand on a, a pin or whatever it is that so that you feel pain right but in, in a general sense that's what's happening now there's also reflexes and stuff like that i'm not going to get into all of that but for the spinal thalamic tract, that's essentially what's happening, okay? So we're going to decussate a couple levels up from where the signal comes in, and then it's going to go to the contralateral primary somatosensory cortex. Now, if you understand that, the DCML isn't too bad. So the DCML is essentially the same concept, right? You have mechan Now, the DCML is going to be vibration, proprioception, light touch, right? So you have some signal that comes in from, from, from vibration or whatever it is, right? Again, dorsal root ganglia because it's sensory signal coming in. It's going to go to the dorsal columns. So now that signal is going to go up as a first order neuron, actually. It's going to go up, up, up all the way until you get to the medulla. And then it's going to cross over through the medial lemniscus, which we talked about before. Remember, midline structure, medial lemniscus. You can see it's midline here. It's going to decussate at the medulla. And that's going to go all the way up to the thalamus primary somatosensory cortex. Okay. So again, it's going to end up contralaterally, just like the spinal thalamic tract. The difference is, is when it crosses. It doesn't cross until you get to the medulla. So it goes all the way up the spinal cord and then it crosses. Okay, so that's the difference. That's the big difference. Finally, let's just take a look at the corticospinal tract. So now we're going from the brain down to innervate a muscle. Okay, so we're going from the brain down. We're going the opposite direction. So we're going down from the brain, motor cortex, down, 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 through the medulla, 
Notice this whole time we're ipsilateral. We never cross. All right, so we're going from the brain, from the motor cortex, primary motor cortex, down to the medulla. And some of the fibers, uh, most of the fibers here are going to cross, okay, at the medulla. And some of these fibers can go to um, the facial muscles. Some of these fibers can go to the upper extremities, lower extremities. Eventually, we'll reach some portion of the spinal cord where these, uh, where there'll be a synapse to the lower motor neuron that will go through the ventral horns, right, because now it's motor as opposed to dorsal. And then we'll go out, you know, and simulate a signal to that skeletal muscle. So that's the concept here. And we and we decussated, we crossed here at the medulla. Now notice there are some fibers that remain ipsilateral, but we're just going to kind of ignore that for now. If I do a more detailed neuro video, I'll talk more about that. But in general, you just want to remember that there's a decussation here also at the medulla. And uh, the lower motor neuron is going to usually be right around that level of the spinal cord where it's going to come out and innervate that skeletal muscle. So that's a very simplistic view of it, but that's really what you have to know to understand these. So, <clears throat> sorry guys, I need to take a quick break. But um, if you guys ever have the chance, try these matcha green tea lattes with um, coconut milk. Really, really good. Sometimes I use soy, but coconut milk, really good. <clears throat> All right, let's finish this thing. Back to work. Starting the uh, tracks. So brown saccard syndrome is usually due to a spinal cord lesion due to hemisection injury. Either a knife injury or like a bullet, uh, a lesion or something like that. Some kind of penetrating trauma. So at the site of lesions, let's say the lesions here, where it says one, there will be uh, ipsilateral lower motor neuron signs. And that's because those nerve fibers that are coming off at the site of the lesion are damaged. And so you're going to have weakness, muscle wasting, atrophy in that region, right? Right where that lesion, right where that knife wound or whatever it is occurred. Now, this is the important part, though. Below that lesion on that same side, remember that the DCML, right, the spinal cord, the DCML, the vibration, the proprioception fibers that don't cross until the medulla, right? Those fibers are coming up, 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 waiting to get to the medulla. But now there's a lesion there and it can't go up anymore, right? They're stuck. Everything below that lesion on the same side is going to have deficiencies in vibration and proprioception ipsilaterally because those fibers can't get up the fibers on the other side are just fine fibers on the other side can go straight up um, and cross at the medulla but these fibers cannot contralaterally right you have your spinothalamic tract now remember the spinothalamic tract doesn't cross at the medulla the spinothalamic tract comes in goes up a couple levels right ipsilaterally and then goes through the anterior white commissure and then goes up the spinal thalamic tract at the same level of the lesion is going to be okay that's why there's this gap here well why is that because those fibers that come in contralaterally at the spinal thalamic tract are going to go up a couple levels first so they're going to dodge this lesion right they're going to go up a couple levels then cross but the fibers that are a couple levels below when they go to cross they're going to be stuck Right, they'll eventually run into this lesion and they can't go up any further. That's why you have this gap here between the area affected at the, by the DCML and the area affected by the spinothalamic tract, okay? And that's because those fibers go up a couple levels first, okay? And so the other thing is if the lesion is above T1, so a pretty high up lesion, you can also have an ipsilateral Horner syndrome if you affect the sympathetic tract. So brown saccard is the one that's most frequently asked about and you can see an image of it here. And you can see here that your spinothalamic tracts are gonna be running here, your corticospinal tracts here. And usually it's an entire section that is affected, a hemisection, that's why I call a hemisection, half section injury that's affected at the level of the lesion, okay? Now the anterior cord syndrome is typically going to be due to uh, either ischemia or a burst fracture of the vertebra, classically affecting the anterior spinal artery. So recall that the anterior spinal artery supplies the anterior two thirds portions of the spinal cord, and then there is a posterior spinal arteries, there's two of them that run uh, posteriorly and are gonna supply the dorsal column. So the dorsal columns are relatively preserved. Remember the dorsal columns is gonna be your DCML, your vibration, proprioception, that kind of thing. But the anterior spinal cord, a huge portion of the spinal cord is gonna be affected by this anterior cord syndrome. So the way that this is classically asked about is they'll tell you that this person initially had flaccid paralysis, no reflexes, and then they developed spastic paralysis, hyperreflexia, maybe clonus, right? So they went from what looked like a lower motor neuron lesion to an upper motor neuron lesion. And you're probably wondering what the heck is going on here. These patients will also have loss of pain and temperature below the level of the lesion because the spinothalamic tract is affected, right? Because it's affecting the anterior portion. This is where the spinothalamic tract is. And they'll also have muscle weakness and spasticity, right? Like we said, later on, they'll have spasticity, initially flaccid paralysis, and then they'll have spasticity. And the reason that they have flaccid paralysis initially and then they develop spasticity is because they initially have spinal 
shock. So right when the injury happens or the ischemia happens, it's almost like everything shuts down, the lower motor neurons included, and you initially have like a shock, a spinal shock syndrome that then turns into, once those lower motor, motor neurons start firing and there's upper motor neuron injury, then you're going to go into the spastic paresis or the hyperreflexia and the, and the spasticity that we classically see with upper motor neuron lesions. So that's classic for the anterior cord syndrome. And remember, you're also going to retain proprioception and vibration sense. And you could also have bowel and bladder dysfunction. For example, urinary retention is um, also relatively common with anterior cord syndrome as well. Okay, so one more thing to kind of talk about, and this is more for the gunner, so to speak. But here you can see your aorta. Here's your vertebral column. Here's your spinal cord back here. Um, and you can see that the anterior spinal artery is running up here. And when the anterior spinal artery goes up, eventually it will form the two vertebral arteries, right, that go uh, through the foramen magnum. But in any case, here's the anterior spinal artery, and then you can see your two posterior spinal arteries back here. Now notice there's this one artery that comes off here from the anterior spinal artery, okay? And this is the artery of Adam Kievich. Now this artery is uh, an artery that helps connect the anterior spinal artery to the aorta. And notice there's multiple arteries that do this, but this is one of the arteries that is commonly asked about, not so much on step one, a little more on step two, but if you go into surgery, you should definitely know this. And that's because it is the largest of these inferior branches that are going to the anterior spinal artery. And it's the largest branch that is a branch of the aorta. So for example, if a patient has an aortic dissection or they have a ballooning of the aorta or an aortic aneurysm or any surgeries that are done on the aorta, they can get a thrombus or dissection into to the artery of Adam Kievich into the anterior spinal artery or an embolism into the anterior spinal artery through this large branch of the aorta, okay? So that can also cause anterior cord syndrome. Okay, so now let's talk about central cord syndrome. So it's like it says, you're affecting the center of the cord. Now remember, this is actually gonna be very similar to the syringomelia that we talked about before, right? Because that was essentially a fluid-filled cyst in the center of the cord, classically affecting the cape-like distribution of pain and temperature because the spinothalamic tract crosses the anterior right commissure right where that syringomyelia would be. Okay, but for central cord syndrome, this is going to be asked about classically with hyperextension injuries in the elderly. That's usually how it's asked about. So it might be an elderly person that fell or was in a car accident or something like that, and they had some kind of cervical spinal injury. And then now they have loss of pain and temperature below the level of the lesion, right, because we're affecting the area where the spinothalamic tract decussates over. These patients can also have Lermit sign like you see in MS, um, just because it's it's a cervical lesion, and that's classic for a lot of the cervical lesions of the spinal cord. But again, classically cervical lesion in the elderly due to hyperextension, and it's weakness more in the upper extremities than the lower because we're affecting the cervical region typically and pain and temperature loss because the spinothalamic tract crosses the anterior white commissure. Okay, now let's talk about posterior cord syndromes. So these are going to be classically going to be your tabes dorsalis and your subacute combined degeneration. So I didn't have a ton of room left on here, but I'm going to talk pretty fast. So tabes dorsalis is due to neurodegeneration because of neurosyphilis. Typically, it's going to be your more of your tertiary syphilis. Now, this is going to present with a positive Romberg sign, right? When you have the patient close their eyes and, you know, they start to tip and fall because they're losing that visual sense that they need to stay upright because they have some other problem with neurodegeneration. These patients will have the argo robertson pupils. And these are going to be bilateral pupils that can accommodate, but they do not react to bright light. And because this is a posterior cord syndrome. Now we're talking about the dorsal columns being affected, which is going to be your DCML, which is vibration and proprioception. And I also want to say one thing, going back to the Argo Robertson pupil, sometimes because they, the eyes can accommodate, right, when you do the accommodation testing, they're, they're going to have uh, constriction from accommodation, but not because of bright light. That's sometimes called light near disassociation. That means that when you shine light, nothing happens. When you have them, when you get near, right, you put your finger really close, the and they're, you know, they're watching your finger, and their pupils are going to constrict. So the pupils are constricting when your finger is near, but they're not constricting to a bright light. So that's why it's light near disassociation. And then for Perinod syndrome, so Perinod syndrome is not particularly high yield, but again, it's becoming more regularly asked about. So some interesting things about this. The first one is you can have these pseudo uh, Argo Robertson pupils, where essentially, um, you know, when you think Argo Robertson pupil, when you think of Argo Robertson pupil, you're thinking syphilis, right? But you can also see those same symptoms in a patient that has Paranon syndrome. You can also see Collier sign, which is a sign of, uh, which is essentially eyelid retraction, which indicates a midbrain lesion specifically. Usually talked about with Paranon syndrome, okay? But you can also see this with a couple other uh, diseases that affect the midbrain. But you can see the, the eyelids 
are barely visible, right? They're pushed way back. This person almost looks like they have Graves' disease a little bit. And essentially, Perinod syndrome is due to compressive forces on the midbrain, particularly the dorsal midbrain. And the interesting thing about it is usually in a question stem, it's going to be a young patient that has these symptoms, that has a pseudoarchal Robertson pupil, but they're negative for syphilis and they have some signs of brain stem lesions like the Collier sign, and you do some imaging and they have a, a mass. The mass is classically going to be in the pineal gland, and um, that's usually how it's asked about with Perinaut syndrome. So just remember the P from both words, and that can help you uh, kind of remember what the lesion usually is. And you can also have a vertical gaze palsy here as well, where they're not able to look up and down, kind of the opposite of your locked-in syndrome. And also remember, subacute combined degeneration is also technically a posterior cord syndrome because it's affecting the dorsal columns. Classically from B12 deficiency, right? Folate deficiency shouldn't cause neurologic symptoms. Only B12 deficiency usually does that. Both folate and B12 will have increased levels of homocysteine, but remember B12 will have increased levels of um, methylmalonic acid, whereas uh, folate deficiency should not. And Friedrich's ataxia also can cause a posterior cord-like syndrome, but I'll talk about that in a couple slides. Okay, here we go. Friedrich's ataxia. Look at that. So Friedrich's ataxia is usually going to be in a young patient with diabetes and or heart disease. So that's classically, <clears throat> now Friedrich's ataxia is a part of these four disorders that are trinucleotide repeats. So you have your fragile X, right, your CGG, Friedrich's ataxia, your GAA, Huntington's disease, which is your CAG, and myotonic dystrophy, which is your uh, type 1, which is your CTG. Okay, so just remember that. Chromosome 9, so if you do C plus 9, right, so I just remember C is 1, <clears throat> C is 1 letter plus 9, Chromosome 9, that's 10, and there's 10 letters in Friedrich, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I don't know if that's an easy way to remember it, but uh, I'm sure there's better mnemonics in first aid. But but um, so chromosome 9. And so these patients, this is going to be someone who's usually a younger patient. They're having staggering gait. They're having a uh, history of falls. And they also have diabetes and they might have insulin resistance. And maybe they have hokum or some kind of heart disease, congenital heart disease. Um, that's going to be classic for Friedrich's ataxia. And a staggering gait, frequent falls, is due to dorsal column pathology. And the whole idea here is you have a defect in frataxin, which is an, actually an iron binding protein that essentially leads to impaired mitochondrial function and then degeneration of different areas of the spinal cord tracts, usually like we said in the uh, posterior columns, and it also leads to insulin resistance, which is why these patients have diabetes. You can also see the uh, the very high arching foot in Friedrich's ataxia like you do in the uh, Charcot-Marie-Tooth disease as well. Okay, so ALS, this is going to be in an older patient, usually 50 to 60 years old, is, is usually the age range that you see this um, mostly diagnosed in. And this is going to, the big thing about it is when you think a ALS, remember the myotrophic in the name, right? I always remember the M in uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis as motor. Okay, so that's what's affected is motor, upper motor neuron and lower, lower motor neuron. So when you think ALS, think motor. Okay, that's what's being affected. Now, there's sporadic uh, cases of this, there's familial cases. In general, the sensation is pretty much intact. Though. Like we said, it's just motor. So remember the M and A myotrophic, that M, I always sticks out in my mind as being motor. Now, the interesting thing here is the Riluzol is pretty much just associated with treatment for this condition. I, I, it might be used for other things, but I haven't seen it used for anything else. Um, and it's the only medication that's really known to slow this disease process down a little bit, but there's no cure. There's really just supportive treatment. Okay, so myasthenia gravis, this is going to have an, it has an interesting distribution. It's usually either in young women, 20s, uh, 30s, or older men, like 50s, 60s, 70s. Risk factors include the HLA-B8 gene. Now, the big thing here to remember, though, are these antibodies versus the acetylcholine receptor or the muscle-specific uh, tyrosine kinase. And I've actually had to do presentations on this uh, disease process, so I'm quite familiar with it. And the big thing that I want to, you to remember that they ask about with this is the thymoma. So, you know, you get, you know, you have a patient, they have ptosis, you put an ice pack on their eye, all of a sudden it gets better. Oh, it's probably myasthenia. You draw antibodies on them, right? What are you looking for? Acetylcholine receptor binding antibodies. So I know I'm jumping around all over the place, but um, I'm just so excited to talk about myasthenia gravis. So let me, let me just tell you a little bit here. So the idea here is you have a nerve impulse that comes down here, right? Here's your presynaptic nerve. Here's your muscle, right? You have nerve impulse comes down here. It stimulates these calcium channels to open. Voltage-gated calcium channels, right? So this voltage from the nerve impulse opens the calcium channels. Calcium comes in. It helps synaptobrevin, and these snare proteins allow for these vesicles that are filled with acetylcholine to go to the synaptic cleft, release the acetylcholine. The acetylcholine then is in the synaptic cleft, binds the acetylcholine receptors, stimulates the uh, postsynaptic muscle, right? That's the general concept. Now, in myasthenia gravis, you have acetylcholine receptor antibodies. They either block this or modulate these receptors. It prevents 
essentially the acetylcholine signal from coming through. And when you put the ice pack on somebody's eye, if they have ptosis, right, you put it, you take a latex glove, you put some ice in it and they get better, you know, and the ptosis goes away after a couple minutes. Uh, the reason for that is because the, the cold uh, sensation from the ice actually inhibits the enzymatic activity of acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase, remember, breaks down acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. So by modulating the activity of acetylcholinesterase, you actually allow more acetylcholine to bind to these receptors, and that ptosis that the person has improves because of that cold temperature. So again, in a board question, usually you're looking for these acetylcholine receptor antibodies, which are most commonly associated with the disease. If there's a high titer of these antibodies, there is an association with thymomas or thymic hyperplasia at the very least. And so if you have a case where you have someone, you're like, oh, I know this is myasthenia gravis, or they already have positive acetylcholine receptor antibodies or positive MS uh, muscle specific kinase, uh, tyrosine kinase antibodies, you would want to do a CT of the chest to look for thymoma. Now the thing is, this is still semi-controversial, like if you actually take these thymomas out, especially if they're benign, but in questions, they love to ask this, that do you know the association that you should at least do a CT of the chest to look for thymoma potentially if this person has myasthenia gravis. So make sure you're familiar with that. And make sure you remember this is type 2 hypersensitivity because the antibodies are binding to the receptor. And so it's fluctuating muscle weakness with worse with continued use. Classically, ocular symptoms, ptosis, blurred vision. Now there used to be this edrophonium test that was used. And the concept here is edrophonium is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. I talked about this a lot in the uh, 200 high yield facts video, but um, they used to be used because you can improve the symptoms transiently by giving it, uh, inhibiting the breakdown of acetylcholine. Uh, however, it's not really used diagnostically anymore where you could just draw somebody's blood and look for acetylcholine receptor antibodies, right? Why would you do, why would you give them this drug that's, you know, potentially has uh, side effects? Other things on here, not as high yield. EMG shows decremental decrease in mus mu muscle action potentials. And that's because, like we talked about, it's worse with continued use. It's particularly important to remember that worse with continued use. Peridostigmine uh, for symptomatic improvement because it's acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Plasma exchange or IVIG for long-term immunotherapy, okay? And you can use either one of these also for Lambert-Eaton syndrome, which I'm going to talk about in a second here. So, so Lambert-Eaton syndrome. Let's go back to our picture here. Remember, nerve impulse comes down. We open up these calcium channels. Now, in Lambert-Eaton syndrome, instead of you having antibodies to these receptors, now the antibody is actually to the voltage-gated calcium channels. And so it can block the calcium from coming in, so the acetylcholine never gets released. And so that, as you can imagine, can also cause problems, right? It's going to cause a decrease in the acetylcholine release. Again, type 2 hypersensitivity because it's, it's an antibody binding to its target, in this case, the voltage-gated calcium channel. The big thing that I want you to remember is Lambert-Eaton syndrome improves with continued muscle use, whereas myasthenia worsens. The other thing is Lambert-Eaton syndrome, you definitely want to do a workup for cancer, for perineoplastic syndromes, particularly small cell lung cancer. The beauty of it is, in most cases, you probably just do a CT chest. You can maybe do a chest x-ray first uh, for Lambert-Eaton. Um, and it classically presents with proximal muscle weakness, decreased tendon reflexes, not really specific though, right? And they're going to tell you that it gets better with use. Sometimes the way they'll word this is a patient with myasthenia gravis will have more symptoms in the evening, or as a person with Lambert-Eaton syndrome will have more symptoms in the morning, right? That's another way to kind of say that. And usually Lambert-Eaton syndrome will spare the extraocular muscles, okay? If you did the androphonium test, it would actually be negative in Lambert-Eaton syndrome, right? It's not going to help if you inhibit acetylcholinesterase because you're not even putting acetylcholine in the cleft to begin with, okay? So that's the difference. You Here you can see there's this large lobulated mass. It looks like it's in the right upper lobe perhaps, um, probably some kind of cancer uh, in this person with Lambert-Eaton syndrome, and there's probably an antibody that's being formed to the tumor cells that is cross-reacting with these voltage-gated calcium channels, and that is essentially your perineoplastic syndromes, right? All right, Bell's palsy versus stroke. I'm going to go quick through this, guys, just because there's not a lot of time left. You can see that the upper division of the face is going to have dual innervation from both sides of the brain. So this left side of this person's upper face is going to get innervation from the right and left sides of the brain, whereas the lower division of the face is only going to get innervation contralaterally, okay? Because of that, if you have a stroke on your right side of your brain, then you're still going to be okay on the left side of your forehead, right? Because you have dual innervation. This side can still pick up the slack. However, because there's only a single innervation to the lower part of the face, you're going to have facial droop, right? Because now you, th there's going to be a problem here in terms of the innervation. If you have Bell's palsy, you're going to knock out the innervation distal, the nucleus here. So it's going to be more lower motor neuron, and so it's going to have complete droop on both sides. And so Bell's palsy will 
have ipsilateral facial weakness, including the forehead, whereas usually a stroke will spare the forehead, okay? And Bell's palsy, typically younger patients, sudden onset, look for idiopathic causes. You can also have parasympathetic uh, you know, problems as well because there's parasympathetic fibers that run through the facial nerve, including uh, fibers to the submandibular glands, sublingual glands, salivary glands. Um, you can have dry mouth, dry eyes, uh, impaired taste sensation in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, hyperacusis, all that good stuff that we talked about with the facial nerve. Okay, so zebras. I titled this one just because these are pretty rare disorders, but they're not rare on exams. They're only rare in real life. So Sturge Weber syndrome classically is going to be your port wine stain in the V1, V2 distribution. So you can see an image of that here. So in the V1, V2 distribution, you have your classic port wine stain on one side of the face, classically due to the GNAC uh, gene somatic mutation. And essentially, these are capillary malformations of the face, sometimes called the nevus flamus lesions. So normally, the way that this kind of works is there's a network of nerves that disappears in a given area uh, near the fetus's head during development. And GNAC is essentially responsible for that disappearance. Now, if the GNAC is impaired, it reduces the amount of oxygen and blood flow to the brain, which alters the brain tissue and the nerve migration, and essentially can cause a lot of the symptoms you see with Sturge-Weber syndrome. Now, note that this is not an inherited disease, okay? So there's not like a family history of people that have had Sturge-Weber, at least not in most of the literature. Now, some of the terms that you're classically going to look for are these leptomeningeal angiomas. And they're usually going to be on the same side as the port wine stain, usually. Common findings are going to include like intellectual disability, behavioral problems, seizures, right? Because you have a mass lesion in the brain. The big one to remember, though, when you're thinking about Sturge Weber is the uh, glaucoma. So a very young, you know, three or four-year-old with glaucoma, visual field defects. And then if they have the port wine stain, I mean, that seals the deal, right? So MRI with gadolinium is the preferred test. Let me just show you a, a picture here. So the thing that they're classically going to look for if they give you an image are these tram track calcifications. So you can see on this non-contrast CT here, this lighting up um, that's just kind of coming across. These are the tram track calcifications that are classically associated with Sturge-Weber syndrome. And on this side of the brain, you can see on the MRI, you don't see the calcifications on MRI, but you can see there's this atrophy, right? Look at this side of the brain, look at this side. See all this black space, it's all atrophy on the side of the brain, likely because this person has tram track calcifications on this side. I wanna call your attention to something though. This is not the same patient. These are two different patients, okay? So this person has the tram track calcifications on the left side of their brain, this person has this atrophy on the right side of their brain. Okay, so there's two different people. But if you were to do a CT of this person's head, they probably would have the tram track calcifications right here. <clears throat> so tram tracking sign is classic. In von Hippel-Lindau disease, it is due to a gene mutation on chromosome th uh, 3 of the VHL gene. It leads to the development of, hemio of hemangioblastomas of the CNS, most commonly in the cerebellum and the retina. Now, the big thing that I want to call your attention to for this is it's classically associated uh, with kidney disease, particularly clear cell renal carcinoma. When you think about uh, von Hippel-Lindau, it's going to affect a few organ systems usually in a question, but it almost always is going to either affect the kidneys or the adrenal gland. Now, remember, Clear cell renal carcinoma is a form of renal cell carcinoma, usually presents with hematuria, pain, right, palpable uh, abdominal masses, right, that are usually non-tender because it's cancer, right? If it's an abscess, it's tender. If it's cancer, it's not. So remember, you've got to think about, you know, when you, when you read this in first aid, like, oh, clear cell carcinoma, okay, they're not going to say in the question, this guy's got clear cell carcinoma. They're going to give you this picture, right? They're going to give you this picture, and they're going to say he's got hematuria, Okay, so what is it? It's von hippel -Linda. Well, how did you figure that out? Well, look, so clear cell carcinoma you have, and I don't know if I can make this bigger, but you can look at these on Google. You see all these clear cells, right? You can see a glomerulus, right? Two glomeruli here, and you see all these clear cells. The guy's got hematuria. What is it? Renal cell carcinoma, right? Clear cell carcinoma, um, especially if he has an abdominal mass or, a palpal, or if he has flank tenderness, right? Um, you know, in the right clinical context, right? They're going to have to give you more information, but you guys kind of see where I'm going with this. And males will sometimes have like the scrotal varicoceles as well. And that has to do with if there's a mass and impinges on the venous return. And again, I'm not going to go through all that here because it's getting way off track. But again, put all the pieces together when you're looking at some of these questions. And when in doubt, clear cell uh, renal carcinoma, clear cell carcinoma is the most common form of renal cell carcinoma. So just remember that as well. And also pheochromocytoma, right? Pheochromocytoma is a non-malignant tumor of the adrenal medulla that releases catecholamines, causes episodic hypertension, episodic headaches in like 90% of cases. They have to tell you it's episodic headaches 
Um, they might attack cardia as well, and uh, they may do uh, urine testing. They might have urine VMAs or metanephrines. Those are what they test for for FIO. It's also associated with MEN2A and 2B. That's particularly high yield to know. And this image here is an image of a hemi hemangioblastoma in the cerebellum, which is one of the regions that um, are likely uh, affected in VHL. It's usually cerebellum or it'll be the retina. Okay, so lesions in the cerebellum or the retina are also a particular high yield to remember when you're thinking about von hippel lindau Okay, so neurofibromatosis type 1, von Recklinghausen disease, also a dominant mutation in NF1 gene uh, in chromosome 17. Okay, so the big thing though, cafe au lait macules. So you got to remember cafe au lait macules. And it is important to remember these other the chromosomes and the genes because a lot of times you're like, oh, they gave me a cafe au lait macule. They gave me lish nodules. I know it's NF, you know, neurofibromatosis. And then they say, what chromosome is commonly affected with this disease process? And you're like, oh, I, forgot, I didn't memorize the chromosome. So make sure you know, you know, all the information here. The stuff in red is really how you figure out what it is, but then the devil's in the details to get, you know, most of the questions right. Anyway, so here's the cafe au lait spots. Um, again, like we said, autosomal dominant. So that's important to remember. Anything that's not autosomal recessive, you remember. And everything that's autosomal recessive, you don't remember. And then when you have a question and you say, well, it's not one of the X-linked, it's not one of the autosomal dominant, then you know it's autosomal recessive. I don't know if you followed all that. I've been talking for like two and for a long time in these videos. Anyway, okay, so neurofibroma, and these are benign nerve sheath tumors, and they're, they can be like firm or rubbery bumps, of, you know, of all different sizes on people's skin. You, I would look up a couple pictures on Google of these just so you can see some different uh, ways that they present, but usually they start presenting uh, uh, at puberty, and essentially you can you can try burning these off with CO2 and remove them plastic surgery, but a lot of times they'll come back. And then the leash nodules that are, you see here, these are the iris hamartomas. Um, you can see also with NF type 1. And then the big thing, too, is the optic pathway glioma. So these, um, you know, lesions on the optic nerve. Now, remember, you don't want to get this confused with von Hippel-Lindau disease, right? So you got to look for certain, you know, if they have renal disease, you might be thinking more von Hippel-Lindau. If they have hyperpigmented, you know, macular uh, lesions or patches, you might be thinking more neurofibromatosis, right? And also, I want to say for neurofibromatosis, Type 1, they commonly have like cognitive learning disabilities. Autism is also common for NF1. Okay, so for neurofibromatosis type 2, autosomal dominant, uh, chromosome 22, right? Type 2, 22, mutation in the protein encoding Merlin. Now, essentially, one, one thing I want you to remember is that the mutation in NF1 and NF2, both are mutations in tumor suppressor genes. So when, you, when they're mutated, the thing that is supposed to suppress tumors isn't working. And that's why you get a lot of the tumor formation right? Makes sense. Same concept here. So if you lose the tumor suppressor gene, right, you form tumors. What kind of tumor? Well, here it's classically bilateral schwannomas. He is here knowing where these take place, and they're at the cerebellopontine angle. It's, imp it's particularly important to remember that, okay? And so you can see them both here. So schwannomas classically at the uh, cerebellopontine angle. Here's your cerebellum, right, right along this area here, and here's the schwannoma. And so that's classic for neurofibromatosis type 2. And remember, bilateral, there's two of them, right? type 2. Okay, so tuberous sclerosis finally is going to be from the uh, mutations in the TSC1 and TSA2 genes, uh, chromosomes 9 and 16, right? Same chromosome as our uh, Friedrich's ataxia. Uh, hemartin and tuberin form a complex that essentially downregulates your mTOR signaling. Remember, mTOR for growth. When you think mTOR, think growth, right? So normally the hemartin and the uh, tuberin are going to downregulate that growth pathway so it doesn't get out of control. However, when you lose them, cellular growth just proliferates and then you form tumor. You can form these cerebral cortex or cortical hematomas that are basically associated with seizures and they're very difficult to control. And so without that mTOR pathway, you get the subependymal astrocytic proliferation that causes these, these uh, hematomas in the brain and those are space occupying lesions that can lead to seizures. Okay, you can also get these in the retina as well, um, in the heart tissue, in the renal tissue. So it's, you can see these disorders, there's a lot of stuff going on. But the, really the way to kind of distinguish these are you're going to look for these hypopigmented lesions. So just making the connection to micro here really quickly. So when you see these lesions, right, you might be thinking tuberous sclerosis. There's these hypopigmented patches. But when you're thinking micro, microbiology, right, what else you might be thinking about here? Maybe tinea versicolor, right? So just make sure that you're, you're familiar with what a hypopigmented lesion actually means to you in a question stem. So in this case, we're thinking more of the tuberous sclerosis. Again, just see what they're asking about, right? They're not usually not going to be asking about tinea versicolor and, and uh, tuberous sclerosis in the same question. But in any case, hypopigmentation, 
versus neurofibromatosis, which is hyperpigmentation. And then you can also have the uh, shagreen patches. Bring up a picture of that. So these essentially are these patches of this like localized leathery thickenings that they'll talk about. They're not going to say in a question it's a shagreen patch, right? They're going to say there's this leathery like thickening, you know, on the skin, right? And that's what they're referring to. The other thing is sometimes these, these uh, infants can have uh, spasms, like sudden onset tonic muscle contractions or seizures. Um, that produce like flexion, extension of the trunk, extremities, and, and all different kinds of patterns can happen. And this is sometimes referred to as the uh, hips arrhythmia on EEG, okay? And that's classic for this pathology. And the unique thing is anytime that you can treat these kind of, anytime you can kind of treat these diseases or these kind of seizures with something that our body makes, that test writers love to ask about that. So you can treat these infantile spasms with giving them ACTH. Okay, guys, home stretch here. So uh, talking about headaches, so there are primary and secondary headaches. The first thing you want to do is you want to rule out any red flags that can indicate like a serious pathology, right? So for example, the thunderclap headaches, worst headache of my life, you know, a focal neurologic deficit that just came on acutely with a headache. Those are all things that are very serious. And those are indicative more of like a, a, some other etiology causing the headaches. Those are secondary headaches. So here we're going to talk more about the primary headaches. So tension type headaches are like the bilateral band-like headaches that they usually last longer than 30 minutes. It can be anywhere from four to six hours uh, in between headaches. And usually you can abort symptoms of these with using like NSAIDs or you can use acetaminophen. You know, basic, basic uh, stuff here and for prophylaxis you can use amitriptyline and this is not specific to tension you can use amitriptyline as prophylaxis for a lot of these different disorders okay so migraine is can be unilateral can be bilateral but the big things that uh, make it stand out is it's more pulsatile it can be throbbing too but pulsatile sharp headaches that are associated with photophobia or phonophobia right they don't like bright lights they don't like loud sounds um, they might have some nausea, some vomiting, they might have aura, they might have a certain smell or taste or something that happens before the headache comes. They know they're going to get a headache. They've had it happen before. Um, there's a lot of different triggers. It could be, you know, just, it's, oh, it's going to rain tonight. I'm, I'm going to get migraines, right? Um, so I put some of them here, how long they last, four to 72 hours. Um, and these And these are very, very difficult to deal with. For a lot of patients so again you can try NSAIDs and acetaminophen are always a good first line option if they give it to you as an option uh, but typically they're really asking for sumatriptan in questions okay so that's how you can abort this uh, you can like i said you can try NSAIDs and acetaminophen if it's an option but if that doesn't work you'd use triptan specifically sumatriptan is good you can also use the uh, the ergo alkaloids as well in terms of prophylaxis propranolol is something they can take in the long term if they have a history of migraines they can take propranolol to prevent future migraines, but they do, propranolol doesn't abort the migraine, right? That's what the sumatriptan does. So make sure you're familiar with that. Now, if a question is asking, let's say you have a young child, maybe they're 10 years old, okay? They have a, a my, what sounds like a migraine. You don't want to jump right to meds. If there's ever an option that says you can put them in a dark, quiet room to start with a cool cloth on their forehead, that's always a, 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 the right answer before you start jumping to meds. And that might be true for all patients, particularly for children. Though. Okay, cluster headaches, unilateral, almost always unilateral. Um, so you notice how we went from bilateral to mixed to unilateral. Repetitive stab-like headaches. And the classic, classic thing is they're periorbital with ipsilateral autonomic symptoms. And so when we say ipsilateral autonomic symptoms, we're talking about lacrimation, right? Rhinorrhea, even Horner syndrome, potentially on the affected side. Okay, so that makes it very unique from the others. The pain is severely debilitating, classically happens at night. And the interesting treatment here is 100% oxygen to abort the symptoms. You can try triptans and that kind of thing, but test writers don't like to ask about that because they associate that with migraines. So you want to think about 100% oxygen to abort the symptoms, and then verapamil is the prophylaxis. There's a lot of prophylaxis you can actually use for cluster headaches, including lithium and some other options, but uh, verapamil is the one you really want to remember if you have to remember one. You can also remember for this you can use uh, topiramate as well. So I would say remember verapamil and then topiramate. And then if you have a chronic form that you're prophylaxing against, you can also use lithium. Okay, then we have our trigeminal neuralgia, which is the tic de la rue. Um, these are very, very brief compared to these other headaches. I mean, this is, you know, 15 minutes to three hours, uh, four to 72 hours. So the, instead, these are just like really short, a couple, few minutes usually, uh, very brief episodes of pain in the V2, right? V2, V3 region. And usually this is a person in a board question that was just chewing some gum or maybe they were shaving. All of a sudden they just had this triggering sharp shooting pain down, you know, the jawline or something like that um, that went away relatively quickly. And um, there's a lot of different causes for this, and I'm not going to go through all of this here, but the big thing that you want to remember is you abort them with carbamazepine. Okay, pseudotumor cerebrae. Classically, this is going to be an overweight young woman 
you know, 20s, early 30s. Um, maybe she is taking isotretinoin for acne or she's uh, taking hormones or OCPs or um, maybe she's taking, glu you know, glucocorticoids or steroids or something. Um, so those things all will increase your risk also for pseudotumor cerebrae. And so these patients will have headache, which is the most common symptom that's worse with lying flat. And a lot of times that's pretty serious. When you think worse with lying flat, you're thinking increased intracranial pressure, maybe brain tumor, improves with standing. So that's kind of a red flag symptom. Um, they might also have some vision changes, some peripheral field defects. Uh, lateral rectus palsy is classic for pseudotumor cerebrae due to the increase in intracranial pressure. Like we talked about when we talked about some of the herniations and that kind of thing. They can have papilledema. And classically, when you look at the optic disc, you'll see papilledema. And I'll try and put a picture in here um, if I don't forget so that you can see what papilledema looks like. Now, a lot of times um, there'll be an MRI that's done here that shows an empty cella. The whole point of doing the MRI is basically to rule out a cerebral venous thrombosis or something more serious that can cause the increase in intracranial pressure. Um, but if they mention an empty cella and you haven't already figured out that it's pseudotumor cerebri, that pretty much should give it away. Now, the treatment for this disease, you want to use acetazolamide. Um, acetazolamide, essentially, when we think about it, we think about it functioning in the proximal kidney tubule, um, but it doesn't work great as a diuretic, but it actually works well to inhibit the chorae plexus's uh, carbonic anhydrase and decrease the CSF and intracranial pressure. So it works well actually in this disease process. So acetazolamide is good. And then obviously stop offending agents, weight loss, those are all going to um, always be right answers also. Okay, so for brain lesions, um, frontal lobe, we talked about a lot of these already, but disinhibition. So this really comes in with the frontal temporal dementia, right? You know, things you normally might think but wouldn't say, you know, you start to say. And and that um, comes in impaired in judgment, right? Also with the frontal lobe, this is that executive decision making. They also can have a, a magnetic gait where their feet almost look like they're going like this along the ground, like you can't get the foot off the ground, magnetic gait. Um, and then if, the, if a stroke, for example, effect, affected the frontal lobe and it damaged the frontal eye fields, you would have eye deviation toward the side of the lesion, right? Wherever the eyes go, that's telling you where the lesion is. Uh, like we talked about, a lesion in the inferior frontal lobe of the dominant hemisphere, which is usually the left, then you're thinking broke as aphasia, right? Okay, so for parietal lobes, if it's the dominant lobe, again, we're thinking of Gerstmann syndrome. So what's that? So that's agraphia, acalculia, finger agnosia, difficulty distinguishing your right side from your left side. So agraphia, just to uh, familiar, familiarize you guys, that's inability to write. This is inability to do simple math calculations. Finger agno agnosia is the inability for a patient to recognize their own fingers or their hands. So if you ask them to say, you know, point to your thumb, they're unable to do that. They can't recognize their own hands and they have right to left confusion. So if you see that difficulty with math, difficulty with writing, finger association, you might be thinking of a left parietal infarct typically. What about if it's the non-dominant parietal lobe? In those cases, they might have contralateral hemineglect, okay? So the non-dominant hemisphere is classically going to be associated with a contralateral hemineglect, distortion of perceived space and extinction. So, so extinction is essentially the impaired ability to perceive multiple stimuli simultaneously. So if you have, you know, poking on one end and a cold object on another, they really have difficulty distinguishing the different uh, stimuli. And then remember, you can have your right inferior quadrantopsia with the parietal lobe lesions as well. For the temporal lobe, classically, Wernicke's aphasia, right? If it's on the dominant side, you can also have your right superior quadrantopsias, um, also because of lesions in the Myers loop. And also remember that your limbic structures are primarily going to be in the medial temporal lobe. These patients can have seizures in the medial temporal lobe that commonly present with emotional changes, including fear, okay? And that's because if you think about your limbic structures, right, you're thinking majorly about the amygdala. So medial temporal lobe lesions will classically present with fear due to lesions of the amygdala. And like we said, we talked about this over and over again, bilateral temporal lobe lesions, you're thinking HSV encephalitis, and bilateral amygdala lesions specifically, if it's really in the temporal lobe, medial temporal lobe, you get more of your Kluver Busey syndrome, which is the hyperorality, hypersexuality, and you can also have uh, hallucinations, deja vu, fear, right, all from lesions here. And you can see the bilateral medial temporal lobe lesions. So again, just to recap, because I keep talking about HSV encephalitis, but young person, history of HSV, they have a fever, maybe some personality changes, some confusion. You do an LP, they got red blood cells or xanthochromia. Um, you might want to start to think about HSV encephalitis. And occipital lobe lesions, we already said, if it's a posterior cerebral artery infarct, right, 
homonymous hemianopsia, you might have macular sparing. Usually they'll give you that on a board question, and they might also have visual hallucinations. Okay, finally, let's talk about dementia. So dementia is essentially a acquired deterioration of cognitive abilities that is going to impair the successful performance of activities of daily living. What does that mean? So these patients will not be able to bathe, groom, meal prep, feed themselves, walk, right? They can't use the bathroom. Those are all activities of daily living. So those things are impaired in the setting of dementia, okay? So that's important when you start to talk about mild cognitive impairment, which does not impair activities of daily living. You can have some little bit of memory loss, right? Maybe not as quick as you used to be, but it doesn't impair your ability to eat, to groom, to ambulate, right? To do the basic activities of daily living. That's how you distinguish mild cognitive impairment or MCI from dementia. Now, we're talking about dementia to distinguish all of these. And believe me, this is only half of it. I have an entire like 30 minute video on dementias in the high yield playlist. But okay, so when you think dementias, you want to know what happens early. That's important. Okay, so in Alzheimer's dementia, early and gradual episodic memory loss, classically anterior grade memory loss, anterior grade meaning immediate recall is affected. Distant memories are preserved. Remember that. These patients can have difficulty finding words. They're getting lost in their own their own neighborhood. Maybe they have some visual spatial defects potentially as well. Um, classically, medial temporal lobes are involved. We keep talking about temporal lobes. Hippocampus is, is one of the regions that are involved very early. Remember, going full circle here, when we started talking about this video, who knows how many hours ago, um, I said that hippocampal lesions are, are classic for stroke because they're very, very sensitive. Hippocampus is very, very sensitive to anemia. It's also very uh, one of the first areas and the primary areas that are affected in Alzheimer's dementia. Remember, Alzheimer's dementia is the most common form of dementia. If you do an MRI, usually you'll see some kind of atrophy. And if they tell you that there's volume loss in the hippocampus or the medial temporal lobe, they're basically talking about Alzheimer's dementia, right? And if you do histopathology, you're going to see the extra cellular amyloid plaques and um, intraneuronal fibrillary tangles. Let me just show you this here. So here's some neurons. The tangles are inside of the neurons and the plaques are here on the outside, okay? Now, usually you don't have to identify these histologically, but uh, you never know what you're gonna find. So uh, step one does love its histo. And so here you can see some plaques outside of the neuron cells right here. There's one, there's one here, one here. And then here there's some uh, neurofibrillary tangles inside of the neurons. That's, those are classic for Alzheimer's dementia. Now, the APO4E allele is going to increase your risk, if you have it, of developing dementia. Remember, though, it's the 4E allele that increases your risk. The 2E allele is actually protective, so don't get those confused. Um, sometimes they ask about that. And the presenilin 1 on chromosome 14 and the presenilin 2 on chromosome 1 are both associated with early onset dementia. So if you have those, if you have presenilin 1 or presenilin 2, you're, that's associated with an early onset of dementia. Sometimes there'll be a family history of that as well. Now, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like nepazil, rivastigmine, galantamine uh, can be used for mild to moderate dementia. And then for the more moderate to severe, you can use memantine. Remember, these don't cure the patient. They just help slow things down usually and improve symptoms. Okay, so remember what I said. What happens early in the disease? Vascular dementia? early impaired executive functioning. There's a stepwise decline. What does that mean? So these patients usually are what we sometimes call vasculopaths or people that have you know, peripheral artery disease. They've had strokes before, TIAs. They've had um, AFib or coronary artery disease, right? They've had a whole bunch of things going on. And so every time they throw an embolism or a clot or an atherosclerotic plaque or whatever, and they have more ischemia, right? They're going to lose a territory of the brain that they had before. So that's why every time that happens, they have like a, you know, they have like a decline. So they go down, right? And then they kind of even off and it's like, oh, okay, everything's okay. And then boom, they go down again, right? They might have thrown another clot or they have more ischemia. And so that's why it's a stepwise decline. They'll have an acute decline, you know, in, in functioning and then they kind of stabilize and it's okay. And then they have another decline and they're okay. And they have another decline. So that's what we're talking about. Stepwise decline. When they use that term, you think vascular dementia. And remember those patients are going to have a significant vascular history. Usually when they present the patient. Usually they'll have diabetes, coronary artery disease, vascular disease, history of cabbage. You get the idea. Now on a brain MRI, they'll usually show like ischemic changes or hit or some old strokes or something like that. The management typically for these patients is, you know, strict blood pressure management, manage their glucose, give them a statin, um, you know, uh, start them on aspirin to prevent stroke, MI, PE, all that stuff. And um, you can technically use acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like denepazil, rivastigmine, galantamine as well. Um, but usually that's not the best answer on a test because they like to ask about those for Alzheimer's dementia, so then vascular. 
Okay, so for frontotemporal dementia, you can probably guess a lot of these symptoms just because we've been talking about these symptoms so much, but let's just go through it really quickly here. So for frontotemporal dementia, very similar to the kluver Busey syndrome kind of, right? Because you're affecting the temporal lobes. So this one is different because it's relatively younger age of onset usually in the 40s or 60s. Unless you have early onset uh, Alzheimer's dementia because you have a presentilin gene, usually you don't see this 40 to 60 year old onset for dementia uh, in Alzheimer's dementia. Usually it's much older. So the average age is a little older. And remember, what is the early finding? That's how you distinguish these early personality changes, okay? The, there can be dementia as well, but it starts with personality changes. That's how you distinguish these these, uh, that's how you distinguish frontal temporal dementia from some of the other ones on here. Now the MRI is going to classically show atrophy of the frontal and temporal lobe. So I think I have a picture here. So you can see there's atrophy here in the temporal lobe, right, on the sides here, um, compared to this normal brain. And you have some atrophy here in the frontal lobes as well, particularly. So this is significant for frontal temporal dementia. It's important to be able to identify this kind of stuff on an MRI in a board question because they're asking more and more about making the connection to finding these things on imaging. So you can see the atrophy in the brain there. And because frontal temporal dementia is usually autosomal dominant, there's usually a family history of this happening in previous generations and that kind of thing where suddenly there's disinhibition, hyperorality, right? All those things that we kind of talked about before. Weight gain because of the hyper orality they're just eating all the time um, on histopathology you see these ballooning neurons they sometimes called pick bodies essentially pick bodies are hypophosphorylated tau inclusion bodies that look like these round intracellular uh, aggregates of the tau protein now the tau protein is also in alzheimer's dementia and it's actually what forms the neurofibrillary tangles in alzheimer's dementia so it forms tangles inside of the neurons in Alzheimer's dementia and it forms round aggregates of protein in frontal temporal dementia. So for Lewy body dementia, Lewy body dementia is classically associated with this triad of visual hallucinations, Parkinsonism, and fluctuating cognitions. This is someone who is, you know, might be seen uh, staring off into space, talking to a deceased relative. They have uh, symptoms of bradykinesia, really slow movements, postural instability, shuffling gait, resting tremor, right? And they also have fluctuating cognition. So it's it's not just Parkinson's disease, but right? you don't jump right to Parkinson's disease in these cases. Typically, they have to give you a little bit more information to tell you it's Lewy body dementia. In the case of Lewy body dementia, you have Lewy bodies that are found throughout the brain. Now, what is a Lewy body? A Lewy body is an eosinophilic uh, intracytoplasmic inclusion that's found in the, uh, the presynaptic neurons, okay? And so you can see, so this is an example of this uh, eosinophilic intracytoplasmic inclusion, and there's also there's also uh, aggregation of alpha synuclein. Now, like I said, a lot of times you won't be asked to identify the exact picture. You have to put the whole clinical um, context together, but you should be familiar with alpha synuclein associated with Lewy body dementia, and then Lewy bodies that are found throughout the brain. In Parkinson's disease, there are also Lewy bodies, but the Lewy bodies are only found in the substantia nigra and sometimes the locus cerulis. So with Lewy body dementia, they're more systemic throughout the whole brain. Now, the other thing that's going to kind of clue you into this disease process is, let's just say in a board question, a physician sees the resting tremor, sees the bradykinesia, and they think this is Parkinson's disease. And they give this person uh, a dopamine agonist like primiprexol or bromocryptine, right? But what happens is these patients will actually get worse when you give them those drugs as opposed to better like what you would expect with Parkinson's disease. So that also tells you that it's probably Lewy body dementia. Um, neuroleptics, are, they're also very sensitive to, like haloperidol, that will actually worsen the Parkinsonism symptoms, which you would expect, right? Finally, Creutzfeldt jacob disease, spongiform encephalopathy, rapidly progressive. That differentiates it from these. It happens very quickly. When I say rapidly, I mean in like weeks to months. So a person um, will have severe cognitive deficits from a normal baseline very rapidly. Remember, Alzheimer's dementia takes years to develop. The myoclonus from startling, you know, you tap them on the shoulder and they just jump and they go into myoclonus, right? So the concept here is they have these uh, prions. Normally, uh, our prions are PRPC, which is a normal alpha helix. They have this SC, abnormal beta pleated sheet, that essentially can cause the normal alpha helixes to turn into the beta pleated sheets. So it's almost like it's contagious in a way, but not technically, I don't know the right term for that. But essentially, the prions are misfolded, and it leads to neurodegeneration. And the main reason is these PRPSCs are basically resistant to the intracellular proteases that can break down uh, these compounds. So these can't get broken down, so they just keep forming, and they keep turning more and more of the PRPCs into PRPSCs. And so the name spongy form encephalopathy comes from the 
uh, histological image, you can see all of these empty spaces here. It kind of looks like a sponge, and that's due to these uh, cytoplasmic vacuoles that are forming due to neuronal cell death uh, that you see on histology. And so I would be pretty familiar with that image, but usually, like I said, this disease process kind of distinguishes itself from some of the other ones that we talked about. Classically on EEG, the things that you want to remember that they'll ask about, you know, you'll you'll get the whole stem and you'll be like, I know, I know what it is. I know it's spongy form encephalopathy. And then they ask, what's the EEG finding, right? So you want to remember the spike sharp wave pattern. And then on the CSF, you have the 1433 protein. And I'm not going to go into detail why this is. We just don't have the time for it, but just memorize it uh, associated with this disease process. Finally, normal pressure hydrocephalus. I'm really out of room here. So just really quickly, this is a wide base magnetic gate is classically how it's described it's a triad for NPH it's the uh, gate right wide base magnetic gate impaired executive functioning poor concentration all that stuff and then urinary incontinence sometimes it's called wet wobbly wacky wet for the urinary incontinence wobbly for the gate dysfunction and wacky from the cognitive uh, dysfunction and so that's classic for normal pressure hydrocephalus so I always kind of just look for urinary incontinence because the other two findings aren't as specific. They give you urinary incontinence. Now look for the wacky wobbly portion of it. Sometimes what you can, in a board question, they'll they'll say that they assessed somebody's gait and they had a wide base magnetic gait and then they did an LP, they drew off some fluid and now the gait improved or, or their overall symptoms improved. You know, they're talking about normal pressure hydrocephalus if you see that in a question stem. And that's partly because of the, the fluid in the CSF and the ventricular megaly. So you can see here's a normal brain. And you can see here the ventricles are filled with fluid. This is classic for normal pressure hydrocephalus. Okay, guys, this has been um, quite an ambitious video. I uh, think I am uh, losing my voice from talking so much. So um, as you can see, I had a beard in the beginning of the video, and I don't have a beard now. So um, I had to do this in two separate takes just because... I didn't quite have the time to do it all in one take, but thank you guys for watching so much. I really hope you enjoyed this video. It did take me a really long time to make this video, so um, I hope it's worth it. I hope I don't have a lot of errors in here because I did it kind of fast, but let me know what you think in the comments, and I just want to say thank you so much to the Patreon supporters. I have some amazing, amazing uh, Patreon supporters, guys, that, that I, I talk to regularly, and um, I'm just so thankful and grateful for them and, and all the subscribers on the channel. So. Uh, thank you guys so much, and uh, we'll see you in the next one.